uh, we will reconvene and uh, pick up with uh, agenda item eight. Uh, authorization to accept CDC COVID health disparities grant funding and authorization to procure services. Uh, we will start, we have a staff presentation on this item, then we'll go to public speakers. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Board. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made clear to a broader audience that differences in health and mental health status among distinct segments of our population exist, and as such has prompted greater support for innovation in addressing this all important topic. While well, I'm happy to report that this is neither a new concept nor one previously ignored by our agency and county, this new high level of support is a heartening development to public health professionals who have dedicated their careers to addressing these barriers. In fact, health equity has been a guiding public health principle for the work of public health and the practice of our agency. And with your board's leadership has taken it to new heights. Today, we are seeking your approval to accept grant funding from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to address COVID-19 health disparities and to authorize competitive procurements, single source procurements and contract amendments related to grant services so we can expedite services. Uh, here with me is Dr. Liz Hernandez, our Assistant Director for Public Health Services to further uh, explore the topic of health equity and to provide some service of this CDC equity plan. Thank you, Nick, and good morning, Chair Fletcher. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and members of the supervisors. As we have seen throughout this pandemic, not everyone has been affected equally by COVID-19. The social determinants of health show us that there are long-standing inequities between various groups. The COVID-19 pandemic heightened the impact of these inequities, particularly for communities who are already under-resourced and experiencing barriers. Specifically in San Diego County, the Latino population and those living in South Region has had the highest rates of COVID-19, hospitalizations, and deaths. <clears throat> Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, it became clear that some communities were impacted more substantially than others. These health disparities are influenced by demographic, economic, and environmental factors. The Healthy Places Index combine, combines 25 community characteristics into a single indexed HPI score. The HPI scores for each census tract can be compared to paint an overall picture of health and well-being in each neighborhood in California. Multiple census tracts to be pulled together into a single score, allowing the comparison of zip codes, project areas, and other geographies. Black residents in San Diego County has had a higher burden of diabetes overall, hypertensive diseases, and CHD compared to the county overall. Hispanic residents in South Region had the highest rates of death, hospitalization, and emergency department discharge due to diabetes compared to Hispanic residents in other regions. The incidence rate of tuberculosis was 3.2 times higher among Asian Pacific Islander residents than the county overall. Diabetes mortality was highest in Mountain Empire, Southeast San Diego, and Lemon Grove communities. Essential hypertension mortality was highest in Santee, La Mesa, and Lakeside communities. Deaths due to disease of the heart were highest in Anza Borrego, Mountain Empire, and Palomar communities. The purpose of this two-year Centers for Disease Control and Prevention grant opportunity is to fund health departments to address COVID-19 health, health disparities and advance health equity by expanding capacity and services to prevent and control COVID-19 infection or transmission among underserved populations at high risk for COVID-19. This grant opportunity focuses on people who have been most affected by COVID-19 and activities must focus on the following groups, specifically African-American, Latino, Native American, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and other people of color. It also focuses on people who live in rural communities, members of religious minorities, LGBTQ people, people with disability and people otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequity. This grant program will address COVID-19 health disparities and advance health equity through implementation of four key strategies and are intended to build infrastructures that both address disparities in the current COVID-19 pandemic and sets the foundation to address future responses. The four strategies of this grant are strategy one, expand existing and or developed new mitigation and prevention resources and services. 
Two, increase and improve data collection and reporting for populations experiencing a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 infection. Three, build, leverage, and expand infrastructure support for COVID-19 prevention and control. Four, mobilize partners and collabor collaborators to advance health equity and address social determinants of health as they relate to COVID-19 health disparities among populations at higher risk and that are underserved. This grant is expected, again, to advance equity and racial justice. Specifically, this grant will help increase the county's capacity to address COVID-19 and improve health equity through strategies, interventions, and services that address systemic barriers and potentially discriminatory practices that have put certain groups at higher risk of COVID-19. The intended outcomes for this, for this grant include, number one, reduce COVID-19 health disparities, two, improved and increased testing and contact tracing, and three, improved department capacity and services to prevent and control COVID-19 or infection. The total grant award is $24,255,805 over two years. The budget is distributed across three main categories of salaries and benefits at $9,353,038. Contractual costs totaling $12,843,448 and other indirect costs that are budgeted about $2 million. And, and Chair, um, this was a highly competitive, and board members, this is a highly competitive grant uh, to get over $24 million for this region. And though we had to fulfill the requirements that the CDC set, they were in great alignment with your board's priorities. With that, this concludes our presentation. Available for any questions your board may have. Thank you all for the uh, for the presentation, and thank you for the work that went into this. This is a proactive effort to go out and uh, and seek additional funding to address health disparities, and uh, and so we, we think it's certainly added to everything we're doing helpful. Uh, let's go to our public speakers, and then after public speakers, we will uh, return to uh, to the board. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have six requests to speak, three of those by phone, uh, three in person, and one group presentation. Also note for the record that we did not receive any e-comments on this item. Any members of the public that requested to speak by phone on this item, please dial into the conference sign now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, and we'll begin with the group presentation in opposition. If all three members of the group are not present, then we'll give you two minutes as individuals. I'd like to invite forward Audra Morgan, Danielle Salinas, and Michael Eric Weisel. All right, group. We're going to go ahead and start your time. So let's uh, let's 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 come on, make, make our way up here, and get get started. If you don't have all three individuals, and we'll we'll give you two minutes as individual speakers. She wound up leaving. Well, uh, I'm Audra. What? Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Audra Morgan. Uh, Journal of Pediatrics stating mass versus risk benefits have been censored along with all the information that goes against the narrative. Other therapies have been censored and kept from the people accessing medical treatments that have been proven to work and that have used, been used for decades providing their safety. The vaccinated who have had adverse reactions are being silenced and unable to share their stories with the public. According to VAERS, over 9,000 deaths have been reported since vaccinations began. COVID-19 deaths should not be seen as more relevant than deaths from the vaccines. Who's gaining uh, financially from these injections? We the people paid to have these injections manufactured and also are the ones paying the price for the adverse reactions, left with no option to seek any legal recourse for the faulty vaccines. The CDC and FDA hiding the deaths and over other vaccine adverse reactions, making those injured to face censorship and silencing. How can they be ignored? If you're pro-science, you'd be willing to listen to these subjects and take in what they are saying as fact and add that to the information you provide for informed consent. These people are left in the dark as the powers that be refuse to accept people are suffering to take these vaccines. The U.S. holds patents on these vaccines. The government and the shadow government stand a profit off of them. 
I know that people are experiencing, what people are experiencing because I myself have gone through autoimmune diseases and these people can't even speak about it. They're not allowed to tell people what's going on and that's really terrifying because I, I know what that's like and if any of you did, you would be more concerned about these adverse reactions than you are because it totally changes these people's lives and it's not said they're trusting the information that you give them. They're trusting that what the government tells them about it being safe and effective is true, but yet they're not getting fully informed information on what's in them, what they're doing, the fact that people are dying, it's just being hidden Thank from you. the Your people. Time is up. Thank you. Your time is up. Next speaker, please. As you're approaching the podium, I'll call the remaining speakers in person on this item. Sandra Martinez, Kristen Vent. Sean Fredrickson and Danielle Salinas. My name is Eric Weiss. I'm a commercial real estate broker in El Cajon. I'm actually in Mr. Uh, Supervisor Joel Anderson's district. And I'd like to talk about a couple issues. The first is we have a $30 trillion deficit in this country. $30 trillion. That works out to about $90,000 per person in this room for every man, woman, and child in America. $90,000 for you, for you, for you, for you, for all of my six children. Who's going to pay that off? We don't even have a plan to not keep running up the deficit. We need to keep this in mind as we start throwing money at every single problem that comes before this body. When are we actually gonna start paying our bills? I got to hear about six deaths in the last six months from the different strains of COVID. Probably about 39 or so, or a little bit more, were in hospitalized, and they suffered six deaths. This last weekend, 100 people were shot in Chicago. 18 of them died in one weekend. Three times the number of people died in one weekend in Chicago because of defunding the police or whatever other problems they have. And now we're throwing lots and lots of money to solve a problem that's one third of the size that took place over six months. We need to keep our priorities in mind. I'd like to thank Supervisor Desmond and Supervisor Anderson for actually trying to get rid of the mask mandate on kids that go to school where none of the evidence suggests that they're at risk. We gotta start non-politicizing the science that we're looking at. And I know I might offend some of my supporters, but I'll tell you, I actually went out and I got, I got the COVID vaccine because I took the risk, I looked at it, and I made my own decision, and I can tell you that since I got that vaccine that Trump authorized under warp speed, I've had absolutely no, 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 no side effect, effects what, what, whatsoever. I am perfect, per, perfectly in good shape. Let's turn the Thank faucets you, back on. Your, your time I'd is like up. to exercise. Can we turn the faucets back on so we don't die of heat exhaustion? Next, next speaker, please. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Sandra Martinez. The board is concerned with health disparity, in particular with relation to COVID. So this is simple, practical, and useful. With this funding, I suggest that you provide D vitamin D supplementation or education about the benefits of vitamin D, especially to people with darker skin who tend to have lower vitamin D levels because of how vitamin D is manufactured in the body. Normal vitamin D levels decrease COVID severity and the risk of hospitalization by 90%. It also helps with many other diseases. Almost all Americans are vitamin D deficient, especially those with darker skins. Vitamin D is over the counter and cheap. It doesn't violate any CDC guidelines. It is not promoted because there's no profit in it, but it is a lifesaver. My second point is about the spike protein. When the spike protein was lab enhanced, it was designed to use four steps to gain entry into the body. Step one, the ACE2 receptor pathway. Step two, the TMPRSS2 receptor. Step three, PR, PR, PRRA. And step four, NRPI to get to the brain. This sounds technical, but I bring it up because it addresses health disparity. Blacks have a higher number of TMPRSS2 receptors in their noses and thus have a higher susceptibility at step number two. There are certain drugs that address that step specifically. To create better outcomes, the public health department should be and can use this funding to educate physicians about the appropriate medicines so doctors can better treat on an individual patient, thus addressing everybody's needs. Next speaker, please.
Kristen Vent. Um, during both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine trials, once one or two symptoms appeared in a participant, it was designated to be a case or event when coupled with a positive PCR test. Once 170 cases occurred in the Pfizer-BioNTech tri trial and 196 cases occurred um, in the Moderna trial, this data was used to calculate efficacy. Shockingly, there were only under 200 cases for a novel therapy, which is being deployed and subjected on millions of people around the world. Furthermore, they are not, they are not being informed that 90 for 95% or so efficacy is calculated based on a useless metric of relative e efficacy and is therefore misleading. Um, the study, in, let's see, so we'll talk about the Pfizer study. They had eight cases in the vaccine group and 162 cases that came up in the placebo group. Um, so if you divide eight by 162, that is 5% of the test group that had cases. Um, therefore, they're claiming, anyways, and the 95% did not. They're claiming that the synthetic gene therapy injections are 95% efficacious, but what they're not factoring in is the size of the denominator. If it is large, then with eight versus, a, larger than eight versus 162, the difference becomes less significant. It matters how many people were in each group, for example, whether this would be 200, 2,000, or 20,000. This is the absolute risk reduction for Pfizer BioNTech. Each group had over 18,000 people. The injection of the injection group, they had eight cases out of 18,198, um, or 0.04%. In the placebo group, there was 0.88%. The, these vaccines are not efficacious. Um, Thank what? you. Next speaker, please. <laughs> <clears throat> Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Sean Fredrickson. Thank you for being here to listen to the voices of the community to know exactly how you should vote. We as the citizens of this county are here to tell you, our representatives, that we do not accept the funding from the CDC. Health disparities and equality, or equity, as you say, it's a popular verbiage. What if those who are fat and happy decide they don't want to be skinny and sad? Just like those who choose not to wear a mask or get a vaccine, are you planning to force fat people on a treadmill to get what you want to ensure that you approve? You sit up here in these chairs and think you have control of what an individual desires. Have you asked them? Have you done a local poll of those residents with health disparities? Of course you've not. You sit here in these comfortable chairs and assume you know. But in reality, do you? Of course not. We see you, we care about our communities, although you don't. We see the money and power you accumulate. We see that you vote yes for money every time. You use the power of unions like those present here, those who've been paid to call with scripts like those that we'll listen to here in a second when the calls begin. We're gonna hear these scripts that we all know. Well, if you're gonna use these, if you're gonna pay these Hispanics to read a script during this board meeting, at least have it written in layman's verbiage because we can read through this. The county is open. Your restrictions have largely been lifted. We've endured the destruction voted on by this board. We managed to keep our businesses afloat while the board worked hard to crush them. You've been paid the last 18 months continually, received funding for a virus, a virus which has claimed less than 100 lives per month in this county the past three months. The fear mongering from this county is to procure more funds, which is preposterous. It's time to move forward. COVID is over, look around, the room is full, there's no longer a, cure, a killer virus. We vote no on this. I assume, knowing how you feel about acquiring money, you'll vote yes. And we had, the, there were two requests to speak by phone on this item. Those individuals have not dialed into the conference line, so that appears to conclude public comment on this item. All right, thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, actually, I'm pleased to see this additional funding source to address COVID-19 disparities in our county, particularly in the rural communities. Uh, the rural per capita income is about 50 grand a year, and, that, and uh, many uh, who live in the rural communities live at the poverty level, and unemployment rates there tend to be higher. We've seen uh, tremendous disparities uh, in these small communities where it's not uncommon for many of them to travel a great distance to receive medical help and trusted uh, medical knowledge. So the rural areas are benefiting from the operation that have greatly benefited 
from uh, operation collaboration. However, uh, we are still in the need of COVID-19 services, and I'm glad to see these opportunities uh, moving forward. I'll move, a, uh, move approval of item eight. All right, motion by Supervisor Desmond to move approval. I'm happy to second that item. Any other board member comments or questions? All right, please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. Thank you. We're going to move to agenda item uh, 14. Uh, this is an item brought forward by myself and Vice Chair Fargus, Fargus framework for the future, improving the county's wellness delivery system uh, to address disparities in our society. Uh, this is an item uh, many of us uh, who spend a lot of time on health care have been working on for a considerable amount of time. And uh, our proposal today basically brings forward two recommendations. One is having our county set up a process uh, to execute county letters of support in the state re-procurement of the Medi-Cal health system plans, uh, along with providing robust and rigorous uh, stakeholder engagement and outreach. Uh, I think it's important to note that the part of that should, should be uh, inclusive of a public meeting uh, where anyone involved in the healthcare system can weigh in and provide some guidance to our health and human services agency. Um, and so a part of this is, is moving forward. I think when we look at everything that happened in COVID, we certainly see the, the tremendous inequities that are present throughout uh, our healthcare system. And we all have a desire uh, to try and have a better system in particular for those almost 900,000 San Diegans that are a part of our Medi-Cal lives in our counties, those that are covered uh, by the uh, state version of uh, the federal Medicare system, Medicaid system. And a challenge that we encounter and run into throughout the system is around the structure of the system. Uh, and how it is set up. And so we're at a unique time and place where the state is going through a redesign and rebuild uh, of what this structure will look like for counties. Um, and so I think this presents an opportunity for us uh, to engage with the public, for the county to get engaged in what we're doing uh, and really be a part of, uh, of, of continuing to move forward uh, with trying to better serve these communities. A part of the challenge that is unique to San Diego County uh, in the Medi-Cal market, which the state has recognized, is the very fragmented nature of our delivery system. Uh, in most counties throughout California, uh, there are one plan or two plans or a county organized health system and maybe one additional plan. Uh, but in 1993, the previous board decided they didn't want to have any particular involvement in this process and San Diego County was carved out of the way 90% of California presently operates in the Medi-Cal market. We are known as what's called a geographic managed care. Uh, us in Sacramento are the only two counties in the state of California uh, with such a plan and such an approach. So what that means in practice is we have seven different Medi-Cal plans uh, that, that are involved in the lives of these almost 900,000 San Diegans. That creates tremendous challenges for our providers. Uh, each of these plans has their own unique bureaucracy. Uh, they have their own priorities, they have their own things that they fund and reimburse in their own unique way that they go about it. And so what we continually hear uh, from everyone in the healthcare space who provides the services to these lives is how challenging and difficult it is to navigate the system and a recognition there's a reality, there's a reason why 90% of California doesn't operate in this way. Uh, it is not as efficient and as recent Cal California Healthcare Foundation report has outlined, it doesn't get as good of outcomes. So the state, as a part of the re-procurement of the Medi-Cal contracts, is saying that San Diego County will align with the rest of California uh, and most likely go into a two-plan model. This is the decision the state of California has made. Uh, the state will also decide which plans will be here. Uh, what we are doing today is having a public process, a stakeholder process, an engagement process, so that we can work with the communities through this process. The state will be putting out the specific criteria of the procurement, and then as a county, uh, we can consider things that might want to be added to that, and we can participate in a letter of support process. Meaning once those state criteria are clear, if we have county things we would like to add, then any plan who applies and meets those criteria would get a county letter of support. As many of them as meet those criteria, that's as many letters of support as we would do, and then those will be sent to the state and the state alone will make the procurement decision on which plans will be operating uh, in San Diego County. Um, and so again, it's a pretty significant change for us here in San Diego County, but it is not an unprecedented situation. I just wanna reiterate all but two counties uh, operate in a measure more similar to, uh, to what we will be moving forward with. 
Uh, and I think this aligns with our board's interest in trying to do everything that we can uh, to try and help this population and support. So today's action, uh, reasonably simple, have us participate in the support letter process, uh, give us some opportunities for public engagement, uh, process feedback, work with stakeholders that are involved in the healthcare space, with community groups, um, and really be, be a part of the system. Uh, I also want to say this is a multi-year process. It is going to take uh, some time for the state to award uh, the contract to the next Medi-Cal plans, and then there will be multi-year phase-in process as we work through helping each of these individual lives uh, go where we are. But we think at the end of this, uh, we will arrive with a Medi-Cal system that has more consistency, uh, that is easier for our pro providers to accommodate, and will provide more services, particularly those services uh, that we think are, uh, are most vital and most important. So uh, it's an important step forward, and I think uh, us being engaged in the process uh, is a positive step. I'd like to go to uh, Vice Chair Vargas, who brought this item forward with me. Then we'll hear from our public speakers and return to the board. Vice Chair Vargas. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher, and I'm really honored to be bringing this item forward with you. Um, as someone who has been uh, in the public health care arena for over 20 years, I think this is extremely an important opportunity for us to recognize that, um, particularly that public input is such an important component. And so uh, I think that uh, the fact that we will be bringing stakeholders to the table to make sure that their input is being considered as we look at ways to improve um, our county wellness managed care system is, is critical, is a critical piece uh, to this board letter. And so um, with that, I'm really looking forward to continuing our conversation um, and moving forward and advancing uh, better health care outcomes for all of our communities. So thank you. Uh, I'm happy to second the motion. Did you make a well, motion? I'll make a motion. And then motion I'll and a second. There you go. All right. Let's go now to our public speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have seven requests to speak on this item. I'll, we'll begin with the in-person speakers. Those individuals that requested to speak by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. I'd like to invite forward Karis Grounds and Demetrius Alexiou. You'll have two minutes to address the board. We'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. They'll be followed by the speakers in opposition of this item, Danielle Salinas, Sean Fredrickson, and Audra Morgan. All right, good afternoon. Uh, Chairman Fletcher, board members, my name is Karis Grounds, and I'm the Vice President of Health and Community Impact at 201 San Diego. And on behalf of 201, I'm here to offer our support for the framework for the future. Uh, 201 San Diego is proud to have worked with the county and the region's many health partners in, the, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks to Chairman Fletcher, Vice Chair Vargas, the entire board, Nick Machion, and the public health team. Our region responded to the once in a lifetime pandemic through an equity lens, ensuring our underserved populations received assistance and access to COVID-19 testing and vaccines. 201 San Diego sits on the crossroads of supply and so, of social and health resources and the demand for those resources. We can all agree that the pandemic shed light to the disparities of our healthcare system and the system of care in general. We work with those disproportionately affected each year, each day. Our 201 staff saw these disparities and they heard the desperation for help for callers who spoke of the barriers they face accessing critical resources. We work with directly with the county teams to address individual and systemic barriers. San Diego is lucky to be the home of the Community Information Exchange or CIE. And 201 is the backbone organization honored to, to really lead this work of the nationally recognized CIE, a growing network of 105 health, social, and community-based organizations that are really working to, together to enhance community care planning. CIE is, more, is used more than, by more than 1,400 helpers who provide social and healthcare services in our community. And by sharing this information, we really shift away from a more reactive system to a proactive system providing holistic and person-centered care. People who agree and have the, choice to, have the choice to agree to have their information shared receive that proactive care from those, uh, those CIE network partners. And currently over 220,000 San Diegans are participating in the CIE and the majority of them are from underserved populations. San Diegans get, co San Diegans get coordinated care through this system. And Thank you. Again, we would love to support, we, we absolutely support the framework and know that this will really help our local networks and infrastructure and provide a true collaboration for our community. Thank you. Next speaker, please.
Good afternoon, uh, Chair Fletcher, honorable members of the Board of Supervisors, Madam CAO. My name is Demetrius Alexio. I'm President and CEO of the Hospital Association of San Diego and Imperial Counties, and I'm here on behalf of our hospitals and health systems in support of item 14. San Diego's hospitals are a key element of the county's healthcare delivery system, providing high quality healthcare to thousands of patients every day, of which Medi-Cal is an increasing proportion of the population our hospitals serve. The Hospital Association of San Diego and Imperial Counties and our member hospitals support the goals outlined in the board letter to achieve better health outcomes, reduce health disparities for our residents, address long-term health impacts of COVID-19, and make our region better positioned to handle any future pandemics or strain to our healthcare system. The HASDIC Board of Directors developed a set of guiding principles that represent hospital and health system priorities for inclusion um, with uh, new Medi-Cal managed care contracts. These principles have many areas of alignment with the proposed guidelines and instructions for the optional letter of support put forward. Our members strongly support efforts to strengthen local oversight and increase accountability. Medi-Cal patients face tremendous barriers trying to navigate a complex system. In our 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment Survey, uh, respondents ranked access to care as the healthcare need of greatest impact on the overall health and well being of San Diegans. This is a once in a decade opportunity to prioritize patients. We appreciate the board's work to improve the health and wellness of all San Diegans and look forward to providing additional feedback as this moves forward. Thank you. I'd like to call forward the speakers in opposition of this item Danielle Salinas, Sean Fredrickson, and Audra Morgan. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Sean Fredrickson. Thank you for being here to listen to the voices of the community to know exactly how to vote. We as the citizens of this county are here to tell you, our representatives, that we do not grant any authority to Medi-Cal, any further authority to Medi-Cal, and continually, which continually ignores the public. As that man stated that he cares about individuals in the hospital, if he actually did, or if these hospitals truly did care about the customers that they have or these residents of, of the county, why didn't they choose to use ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine? Could it be that politics might be involved? Could it be that maybe this vaccine is more profitable? Could it be that you prefer control over a citizenry rather than a cheap, affordable, effective solution like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. There's a fantastic doctor in Houston. He's been interviewed by uh, 1,500 news stations around the world. He speaks nine languages, pretty incredible. That man has been on the news so much, and as these news agencies interview him, they ask him, what exactly are you doing uh, to ensure that your COVID deaths, which he's at 3%, while the national average at 12, 3%, he says, well, I'm do this Math Plus program. I'm, and then he labels the Math Plus program, but the problem is, all the news stations ignore the plus. What exactly is the plus? Well, it's zinc and hydrochloroquine and um, uh, ivermectin. If you actually cared, which I'm beginning to realize you don't, about the citizens in this county, you would not control them nor charge them these irate costs and promote pharma over free or even $3 ivermectin pills. Do you understand the frustration as a citizen who is not paid to be here, who is not a part of a union, who is simply a constitutionalist? And I value freedom in this nation, and I value this board to hear what I'm saying. We as individuals, we as free citizens in this nation are feeling the corruption which Cuba has embraced. Thank Do you, you get my drift? Time is up. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I'm Audra Morgan. Uh, all COVID shots lead to the creation of a spike protein through a process called, trans called translation. The spike protein can damage the body by at least four pathways. The spike protein behaves as a haptin, a small molecule that binds to the surface of organs, leading to an autoimmune response. The spike protein can damage organs directly by promoting cardiovascular complications, damaging blood vessels in the lungs and breaking through the blood-brain barrier, important for protecting the brain. The spike protein can incorporate into human DNA through a process called transfection. The spike protein evokes the release of destructive anti-spike antibodies. 
Spike protein can trigger changes in blood vessel walls, leading to pulmonary artery, artery hypertension, which is fatal even under the best current conventional and alternative treatments. In men, the spike protein can bind to the ACE2 receptor on sperm. Risk of infertility is indicated. Spike protein causes inflammation and disruption of the blood-brain barrier, leading to neuropathy, neuropathology, and brain degradation, de degeneration. Neurological degeneration, spike proteins can damage the FSU gene and mutate to TDP43 protein, leading to ALS. Neurological degeneration, mutation, and altered function of the TDP43 protein can also lead to FTLD a cluster of chronic degenerative neurological diseases. Mutation of the FSU gene can also lead to cancer. Previous coronavirus exposure to the concept called original antigenic sin stops true protection against the SARS-CoV-2 if previously ill with coronavirus infection. There's an increased risk of COVID illness and COVID-related deaths in persons who has been previously vaccinated with an influenza vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. We'll be calling speakers by the last four digits of their phone number. You'll hear a notification that your call has been unmuted. You'll then need to press star six to unmute your line. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. And if you could please identify the first caller. Our first caller is 1081. 1081, please press star six to unmute. Good afternoon, Sarah Fletcher and Board of Supervisors. This is Kathleen Lang, Vice President, Medi-Cal Regional Lead for HealthNet Community Solutions. HealthNet has been serving San Diego County residents for a number of decades, providing health care coverage through Medi-Cal, Medicare, Covered California, employer health plans, and federal services for our military. We appreciate the guidance provided in this agenda item and are encouraged to see that our intentions, as outlined in our CalAIM model of care previously submitted to the Department of Healthcare Services, are in line with the board's direction. Knowing the direction of San Diego County leadership is helpful and will guide planning efforts going forward as we further align with the stipulations, many of which we currently meet or are well positioned to meet. In lieu of services are those optional wraparound services designed for Medi-Cal managed care plans to provide and integrate into population health strategies. Given the volume of work necessary to effectively implement CalAIM, HealthNet has taken a thoughtful approach, partnering collaboratively with community-based organizations, providers, and county agencies to develop an 18-month in lieu of services rollout that launches with six services on January 1st of 2022. HealthNet remains committed to collaborating with our partner health plans, baking in as much administrative simplification as possible for our local provider partners so they can focus on what matters most the Medi-Cal members we serve. HealthNet recognizes the value of CalAIM as a tool to improve the health and wellness of our community and is aggressively building the necessary infrastructure and pursuing meaningful partnerships essential to successful implementation. It is a busy, albeit exciting time. I look forward to working with the board and keeping the board apprised of our progress. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you, and that concludes public comment on this item. Also note for the record that we received three e-comments, two in favor and one neutral. All right, we have a motion by myself, a second by Vice Chair Vargas to approve the recommendations here. Not seeing any requests from my colleagues to speak. Uh, please vote. Okay. So let me ask the clerk if we can uh, just yeah. rescind. Re that, no, 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 that, that, that's okay. We had technical difficulties. So what, can we rescind the vote? Go to Supervisor Anderson and then come back? We didn't complete the vote. So Supervisor Anderson, the floor is yours. Uh, the only, mine's more of a uh, how we proceed question. So uh, we have all the stakeholders. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to push the right buttons, evidently. So uh, I'm used to pushing buttons, but never the right ones. The um, you know, we have all these stakeholders and we're moving forward and, and your explanation was very, very helpful because uh, it, we're not picking to, we're simply qualifying. But that qualification that we put together, uh, and, and I know that we have a subcommittee that's going to do it, 
will that be subcommittee be open to the public? And the, and the reason why I say this is I'm concerned that we have these seven vendors who have done a great job, and I don't want anybody to walk away feeling like uh, the, the, the parameters were set excluding them. So in, in, my, in my opening comments, I alluded to the, the need for public meetings, uh, which all stakeholders can participate in. Excellent. That, well, that, that I heard that, but I want to make sure there was absolute clarity. Absolutely clarity. Yes. Perfect. I'm ready to vote for it. All right, perfect. Thank we you. have a uh, motion by myself, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We're going to move to uh, agenda item 15, uh, amendments to the compensation ordinance. Uh, um, Intergovernmental transfers. Um, I don't believe we have a presentation or comments on this item. Uh, let me ask the clerk if there's any requests for public speakers on item 15. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Yes, there are four requests to speak on this item. Uh, we'll begin with the in person speakers. Um, there are two callers and two in person speakers. Any members of the public that requested to speak on this item by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. I'd like to invite forward Maria Cano and Sarah Johnson. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Is there a reason that the audio shut off? There was a, a brief moment where the audio for the uh, video feed was uh, not working. It has been corrected. Okay, public speakers. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors and Chair Nathan Fletcher. I've been working at Edgemore for 16 plus years. We know that you- can you please state your name for the audio Sorry, record? Sarah Johnson. Thank you. We know that you are aware of our staffing and retention crisis. Most nursing staff will leave before their one year mark. So we're constantly training people and then they leave causing us to train other new people and it's a vicious cycle. We need well-trained consistent nursing staff in order to care for our vulnerable and difficult patient population. We are happy to learn that there is a 5% increase for LVNs and CNAs at Edgemore. It is definitely a start in the right direction. There's definitely a lot of work left to be done. Our pay is definitely not at a good rate to live in San Diego. Thank you, Nick Mascione and Paola for coming to our workplace to hear our concerns. We also are very appreciative of the action you made to support us with hazard pay. And I have some letters here from staff that were unable to make it today that we would like to give to you if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Maria Cano. Uh, it's nice to be here once again. I'm here to represent my fellow coworker CNAs at Edgemore. We are proud members of SEIU Local 221. As is known to the board members, Edgemore is experiencing a shortage of staffing and retention of crisis. It's impacted the patient's care, and we are pleased to see the percentage of 5% increase to our CNAs and LVNs at Edgemore. But as we can see that we're still going through this crisis, not being able to care to our patients as we wanted to due to the shortage. We have so many CNAs and LVNs coming in and out of Edgemore that it's hard to comply with all our, the requirements our patients want. At times, we don't have enough staff to, meet, to cover their needs, and even they don't want to hear the shortage or they don't have the patience to listen to the staff. Even though we're trying our best, we have nurses doing the work of LVN nurses doing the work of RN nurses, and they're doing a great job helping others and even helping as the CNAs to help our patients on a daily basis. We appreciate Director Nick and Ms. Paola for going to Edgemore and hearing our concerns. And we are here as Edgemore staff to thank you guys for listening to, to us. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from those individuals that requested to speak by phone. We'll be calling speakers by the last four digits of their phone number. You'll hear notification that your call has been unmuted. You'll then need to press star six to unmute your line. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. And if you could please identify the caller. Our first caller is 8887, 8887. Please press star six to unmute. Hello, 
my name is Augustine. I'm a senior public health nurse uh, with the County of San Diego. And besides just uh, the atrocious staffing and the hard work we always have to do around here, I just want to say that while we were working this pandemic, um, you know, we got screwed over with our PPE. You guys expected us to do a dangerous job and the limited supply and the scramble to try to find anything and us buying our own supplies just really showed that uh, we were expected to go out into a dangerous environment and, you know, continue to work hard and not even be provided, provided protection. Uh, a lot of people do a really good job of glorifying hard work, but at the end of the day, your words don't help us at all, and especially when people have come along and died uh, working out in the public, keeping our community safe. It just seems like we really need to have some sort of compensation and some sort of plan in place for our hard workers to uh, actually get something for doing what we did during the pandemic. Thank you. Our next caller is 3927. 3927, please press star six to unmute if you'd like to speak on this item. 3927, please press star six to unmute. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Linda Correa. I'm a proud SEIU Local 221 member. I have worked for the county for 28 years at the North Inland Family Research Center. I'm here to urge you to vote yes today for hazard pay and the teleworking stipend to complete the budget process. We have addressed the board many times highlighting the sacrifices that we've made during the pandemic. My story is one of so many of your county employees. I started teleworking in August of 2020, thinking that I could ride out working from the facility. My senior father of 86 years old has an underlying medical condition, heart failure. And at that time, knowing what was happening with COVID, I could not take the chance of putting his life at risk or those in my household or even my coworkers. And as you know, your coworkers, your employees, have always worked the front lines working with the public, frontline workers working at the facilities throughout the county, working at the family research centers, and teleworkers that have worked from home. They've also suffered some way during this pandemic, either their partners or their spouses losing their jobs, losing their own businesses under your districts, living under your districts. We've all suffered through this pandemic one way or another. We've lost household members and loved ones or even county employees getting sick due to the COVID. But your public servant employees never stop providing services to the communities that we serve. They're proud to be your county employees and they continue providing those services. Today is a sign that when supervisors say they support their employees, that means you support us in action Thank and you. not just by your word. Thank you. And that concludes public comment on this item, Chair Fletcher. Thank you. Um, Thank you for all of those uh, who called in to, uh, to speak on this item. Uh, you know, I want to say a special word to our Edgemore uh, team uh, who've worked so incredibly hard uh, over the course of the last year and a half in particular, but even longer than that. Uh, we recognize uh, how hard the conditions are. We recognize the struggles you all have faced and the burden you've borne, uh, you know, in particular in these recent years. And we're trying to take some action to help, uh, both with increase in staffing and increase in compensation to ensure that you can fulfill your mission and charge uh, at that facility. So thank you all very much for everything you've endured. Uh, we recognize there's some challenges there and that's why we're here today to get you a little bit extra help and support uh, in, in hopes that we, we can make uh, make your your mission there a little bit easier to fulfill and your burden just a little bit less, although we'll still be pretty significant by the nature of your job. So thank you for that. Um, I'm happy to uh, to make a motion to, uh, to approve uh, competition ordinance. Um, I have a second by Vice Chair Vargas. We'll go to Supervisor Anderson and then Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to, uh, right. I'd just like to uh, bifurcate the vote if possible and separate uh, so that I'm consistent with what I've done uh, throughout. I certainly understand what the nurses have gone through. 
Um, I'm married to a nurse, and my daughter's a nurse, and I understand the pressures that were on them, and I'm glad that we're able to support them in the way that we have. So I'm asking that we, uh, for a substitute motion, to just take it as two separate votes. Thank you. Um, I, I don't be I believe, Supervisor, because it's an ordinance. It's one ordinance, so you can't really bifurcate the ordinance into, into two separate votes. I can ask, ask counsel. I believe we have to take an up or down vote on this one. The only way would be a substitute motion with a different ordinance, and that's, it's possible, but it's complicated. I do have language if you wanted to do that, but. Uh, let me ask you, would that delay it uh, 30 days, or would we be able to make the vote today? No, any board member can make a substitute motion amending the ordinance if they had the exact language. So, because uh, this is the introduction. Or, or we could vote, and you could just express your thoughts about which parts of it you like and which parts you don't. Uh, if it's, since we do have the language prepared, maybe we could just move forward with the language and just take it uh, as a vote since we have it prepared, and it's not going to delay. I, I, I didn't want to delay it because I understand how important it is. But if you wouldn't mind, uh, colleagues, I'd appreciate it. Let's go to Supervisor Last Room and then we'll come back. Yeah, I have a question actually uh, for council. Um, so if we did bifurcate and we had two votes, would they both need to get four, they'd both be four vote items and in order to be enacted today, is that correct? I believe they're not four vote without looking. I think they're just the introduction of an ordinance if I'm not mistaken. The, the vote is not for an appropriation today, so it would be a three vote item. And there would only I'll be- I'll defer to council. Yeah, there would only be, um, for example, if Supervisor Anderson introduced it substitute motion with a different ordinance, it would be up or down, and if that doesn't pass, then you would might come back to the original. But the, the substitute, okay, if we did a substitute motion, if Supervisor Anderson had a bifurcated ordinance, it would it be one vote on hazard pay, and then a separate ordinance vote on the Edgemore facilities? What we have um, worked on is a way to do it with removing either, either, either hazard pay or telework or both. So I have, I have a way to phrase it, either one, the other, or both. It depends on what the supervisor wants to do. I, I'd like to do whatever my colleagues like to do, make it as easy as possible. I'm not trying to make it difficult, I but I I've been outspoken. I didn't want to have to run through. I mean, the, the, the issue the before us is not, is not incredibly complex. I mean, we've got two pieces of this ordinance, one related to hazard pay, one related to Edgemore. So if we can bifurcate it and take one vote on hazard pay and one vote on Edgemore, but it does not delay the implementation of either one of those Just, items. That was why I was asking, because my understanding is that if we had four votes, then it would go into effect immediately because it would be three. an urgency uh, ordinance. They're both three. They're both three but you can clarify with council, if we bifurcated it and took two separate votes, then it would be three votes to I mean, pass each part of that, is that mm -hmm. correct? It's a little tricky because Assuming one part passes, the net will be either hazard or telework, or maybe both pass, and you want to introduce the ordinance final the way it's going to be, which we have it drafted now so that both telework and hazard pay are in it. There's a substitute motion that could be done saying, I move to take out both of them. There's a substitute motion to say, I move to take out hazard, and a substitute to take out telework. So if, if, if hypothetically Supervisor Anderson made a substitute motion to take out hazard pay, Yes. We adopted Edgemore. Then we could come right back and make a motion to adopt hazard pay and vote on that, and then both would pass. What, what would happen, let's say, it, let's assume it doesn't pass. I'm just making an assumption. Then you would go back to the original ordinance and you could pass the entire Well, thing. let's assume it did pass. If uh -huh. we passed, let's say, hypothetically, we passed the Edgemore part of the ordinance, 5 0, then we would come back and have a second vote on the hazard pay part of the ordinance. And the Edgemore is the telework? No, Edgemore is the facility, the healthcare facility. Hazard pay is telework. Uh, Let me see if I can confuse this even yeah. more. There's more in the compensation ordinance as well because there's uh, uh, the clinical director of behavioral health, the chief medical officer, and the public health officer. So that is one element. There is the Edgemore site premium, which is another element. There is the hazard pay and the um, telework payment. Um, so we've got all of those in one ordinance. If you wanted to break them out individually, then we would have to have language for each one of those ordinances, um, or you can vote on the one ordinance with um, comments that you don't support one element of the ordinance, which is, I believe, what you did during the budget hearings. But I'd leave it up to the supervisors to I determine how that. they want to do the, that. In the budget hearing, I voted no. Look. Uh, uh, I'd like to support uh, the nurses. I'd like to support all those folks. I can't support uh, the COVID pay because my district is just too poor for me to, to do that. Uh, 
Uh, if you want to move forward, I'll just simply vote no. It sounds like you have the votes to get it passed, and I'll just vote against the whole thing. Okay. But I would note that I really would like to support this other stuff. I just can't, in good conscience, uh, vote against my district and the poverty that's in my district. Understood. So, but we don't have, you don't have drafted two separate ordinances. No, no, this would be a change to the existing ordinance. And the net of uh, what I'm hearing from Supervisor Anderson, I believe, would be if everything were to pass, then there's no real way to register that in a, in a separate vote. There just isn't, you know, if, if that were to f fail, but then you pass the entire thing, you end up with the same ordinance that you have now. So registering on the record is, is, is one option that is available for anyone that doesn't want certain pieces of it. It would be difficult now to draft out several serial ordinances to try to well, why don't we move forward and I'll simply vote no, and, and that way you still get it passed. I, I don't want to harm our employees, but on the same token, I've got to be uh, consistent with the people I represent. With the with the audio record being clear, Supervisor, that you, you support the efforts around Edgemore? Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Desmond. Well, thank you. Uh, so, so I supported the pay for a personal sa for the, those who put their personal safety on the line and work directly with the public during COVID-19, which includes the public health, uh, law enforcement, probation, public safety, emergency services, and staff that were required to work in person during these trying times. I previously voted. I previously voted that I do not support the telework hazard pay uh, stipends, and I would like to register for the record a vote against those provisions. But I'll be voting in favor of the other changes of the ordinance. All right. So with all of that clarity, <laughs> we have a uh, motion by myself, uh, seconded by uh, Vice Chair Vargas, to approve uh, the uh, the ordinance uh, as written. Any additional comments from my colleagues? Please vote. Chair Fletcher, with that motion, pursuant to government code section 54953, year prior to taking final action, the legislative body shall orally report a summary of a recommendation for final action on the salary, salary schedule, or compensation paid in the form of fringe benefits of a local agency executive. The recommendation today is to introduce a proposed ordinance that increase, includes an increase to the maximum salary for two executive classifications no, and hazard pay or telework payment for eligible executive unclassified employees. The board adopts the recommendation at its regular meeting on August 3rd. 2021, the classifications of Chief Medical Officer and Public Health Officer will increase from salary grade UCE 022 with a ma maximum salary of $302,224 to a salary grade of UCE 023 with a maximum salary of $312,686.40 annually. In addition, the recommendation to add Section 2.1 point uh, two zero of the compensation ordinance will provide eligible county employees with a one-time hazard pay of either $2,500 or $1,500 or a telework payment of $750, including ex executive unclassified employees with the exception of elected officials. With that, that uh, motion passes with Supervisor Anderson voting no, all other supervisors being present and voting aye. All right, thank you. We're going to move to agenda item 20, advancing inclusion of LGBTQ plus community in San Diego County. Uh, an item brought forward by Vice Chair Vargas and Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Before we hear from our public speakers, let me ask uh, my colleagues who brought forward this item if they'd like to make some introductory comments. Uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher. Um, as we celebrate Pride in San Diego County this month and overall celebrate how far we've come in our advocacy for LGBTQI plus rights, I want to ensure the county's commitment to becoming a more equitable and inclusive workplace uh, is uh, at the forefront. This is why I'm so proud to introduce this board letter together with uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Uh, this letter actually directs the CAO to work with the Department of Human uh, Resources and other appropriate departments to identify areas and opportunities to continue supporting and uplifting the LGBTQI plus community countywide, including our county staff. I want to especially thank the center for collaborating closely with uh, me and my team to ensure that uh, we are continuing to work with the county and county employees as we're uh, moving forward with trainings. And then I also um, want to, I'm grateful to them for assessing various strategies, including but not limited to trainings and the implementation of non-binary gender, gender markers for employee, uh, employee enterprise wide. Um, the county attests our commitment to advancing inclusion for the LGBTQI uh, plus community in San Diego County. The letter also directs the CAO to express support for HR 5, the um, Equality Act, which is a landmark piece of legislation that would provide consistent and explicit non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people and expand federal civil rights laws to protect 
our LGBTQ people from discrimination in employment, housing, credit, jury service, and federally funded programs, such as those for health and education, as well as public places and spaces. Lastly, the letter directs staff to report back on the findings and updates on the implementation of the nine binary uh, marker and other areas of improvement. This is only the beginning of the work that we have to do. I strongly believe that if we're seeking to make change in our communities, we must first look internally to see where we are. And so our employees here in the county should not have to worry about their workplace does not acknowledge their identity as human first. These actions would commit the County of San Diego to being an institution that acknowledges that we are all unique and must be treated with respect and dignity. The diversity and uniqueness of the people that make up our county workforce is what makes them incredibly effective and efficient at meeting their community's needs. And with that, I ask my colleagues for support. I'd like to introduce this as a motion. Supervisor Watson. I just first want to thank my colleague uh, for her leadership in bringing this forward. Um, this is such a vital issue. You know, I think um, to some extent in San Diego County, uh, you know, members of the LGBTQ plus community face uh, real challenges. But when you look across the country, um, you know, there's parts of this country where people are still beaten and killed um, for their uh, sexual orientation and, and sexual identity and gender identity. Um, so it's just so vitally important that we take these steps uh, today in our county to create a safe space um, and equality here in our own community for all members of our community and all, all members of our LGBTQ plus community. So I'm just very proud um, that we are now at a moment um, in our county where uh, we can bring this forward and where we can celebrate diversity and we can do that, um, I think, uh, much more in much more safety um, and without as much fear as in the past. And it's these kinds of actions that create more safety and less fear for people in our community and especially young people today. So I thought I very much uh, hope and uh, urge my colleagues to support this item. Thank you. Is that a second? No, it's a second. All right. <laughs> Uh, we have a motion by Vice Chair Vargas, second by Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Let me ask if we have any requests to speak on this item. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have uh, four individuals that have requested to speak by phone and one group presentation. Any members of the public that requested to speak on this item by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, and this is group presentation in opposition. That includes Audra Morgan, Danielle Salinas, Michael Eric Weiss, and Robert Rivera. You'll have 10 minutes to address the board. All individuals in your group must provide testimony during that 10 minutes, and I'll ask you to please self-regulate your time. And, and again, on this item, the agenda item we are talking about is inclusion of the LGBTQ community in San Diego. Fair enough. And, and I'm not seeing all members of your group, so we'll, we'll give you two minutes as individuals. Sorry to hear that. My name is Michael Eric Wiest. I'm a commercial real estate broker out in San Diego. I addressed you earlier. I'm the father of six children. They've come to me at various times in my life and they've said, Dad, I want a second dessert. Dad, I don't want to go to sleep. Dad, I don't want to do my homework. Dad, I don't want to do the dishes. And I've looked at them and I've said, well, I understand. You don't want to do what you're supposed to do. But I'm not going to just give you what feels good. I'm going to do what's good for you. You have to go and do the dishes so you learn how to be productive. So you don't sit around on welfare the rest of your life. You have to go to sleep so you don't get sick. You have to stop watching TV so that you can learn how to make a living. You have to do what's right. You don't just get to do what feels good. You can't have this myopic addiction to self-gratification by not doing what you're supposed to do. It's not gonna be good for you. I can't just satisfy all of your desires I have to try and save you for a better life, for a better future. And they look at me and say, oh, dad, you're just a hate monger. You're a hater. It's like, no, actually, I love you more than you love yourself at this particular point. I love you more than you love yourself because I want what's best for you. Now, I was hoping to have 10 minutes so I could get to all of these because this is part of my presentation. Can you go ahead and hand that up to everybody? We are living in a society where everyone is being told that they get to do whatever they want. You can only live once, therefore go and be a rebel. But that's suffering. It's a lot of suffering that's happening to those who follow that philosophy. And let me give you some examples. 
In 2019, an estimated 34,800 new HIV infections occurred in the United States. Half of those people end up dying. 69% of those are men having sex with men. The cost of HIV treatment is over $14,000 per person per year. Thank you, your time is up. Next speaker, please. Uh, Audra Morgan. Um, I am very supportive of people, all people having equal rights. And I believe that those who are homosexual or gay deserve that as well. But what's happening is in the county, not everybody's getting equal rights. And we're concerned about some groups and not others. And so that's a concern because what they're telling people on the news is that if people are unvaccinated, that we got to give them a really hard time to make sure that they comply and go ahead and get vaccinated. And if that were to happen to these other groups, there would be a concern because, you know, violence and different things. But what we're doing is protecting some people and not all of them. And that's a huge problem when you know some people are discredited and others are counted as more um, valuable. And, and that's the whole point of the LGBTQ community wanting to have equal rights, <clears throat> excuse me, and they deserve that, but so do everybody else. And I feel like we can't just ignore some people and um, you know make sure that other people are protected because what's gonna happen is it's gonna create a lot of violence when, when we segregate people. And so we shouldn't segregate nobody. Everybody should have equal rights across the board. And unless we're a constitutional county, I just don't see that happening. And we should be. I mean, everybody deserves the right to make a choice in their life. If you wanna be gay, okay. If you wanna take a vaccine, okay. But you can't say, well, if you choose that, you can't come in here or you, know, um, you can't do this in life. I just feel like when do we all get equal rights? At what point? We'll now hear from those individuals that requested to speak by phone. We'll be calling speakers by the last four digits of their phone number. You'll hear a notification that your call has been unmuted. You'll then need to press star six to unmute your phone. We'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record, and I'll remind the public speakers uh, that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. And if you could please identify the first caller. Our first caller is 0143. 0143, please press star six to unmute. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Council Member Andrea Cardenas representing Chula Vista Sports District. Uh, I did have uh, some prepared remarks, but I'm going to go a little bit off of script. Uh, I'm calling today to uh, call in support of Vice Chair Nora Vargas and Supervisor Lawson Women's board recommendation that promotes the adv advancement of um, you know the LGBTQIA plus community in our county. Um, I want to address something that ha was, has been brought up in, in some of the last few speakers. Um, this this board letter specifically, what is trying to be done is to make sure that we are trying to be more inclusive. I think it's amazing that this is being brought up. The fact that we are going to be able to give more opportunities for people to feel seen and that we stop the erasure of people who identify as non-binary. Um, the idea of giving people more rights uh, does not necessarily mean people will stop having rights. Um, it's, human rights are not a, a, a piece of pie where that we'll stop having um, access to that if somebody uh, else has them. And so um, I do want to say that we do live in a beautiful community as we are in San Diego's uh, Pride Month uh, and we celebrate across the county. Uh, how beautiful it is that we are inclusive and uh, at all the great, great people and the great communities that are across our county. Um, it's important to remember that Pride is not just a parade. It's not just a, a tag or, or something for us to, to say easily. Um, it really is a movement, and it's a movement that it saves lives. Um, and it makes it easier for people to feel seen. And so I strongly urge uh, the Board of Supervisors to support uh, this today. And thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Our next caller is 
9518. 9518, please press star six to unmute. Hello, this is Sean Vandiver, and I serve on the board of the directors for the San Diego Convention Center. I served in the Navy for 12 years through the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. My Navy career ended because I marched in the San Diego Pride Parade in 2012. Uh, not because what I did was wrong or even not allowed or I didn't even have to be gay, uh, but because of bigoted ideas like we heard earlier. Uh, this, uh, this proposal brought forward by Vice Chair Vargas and Supervisor Lawson Raymer is so important to the continued growth and progress in, uh, in our county and so important to uh, folks uh, being included in, and, and feeling like they're part of the communities in which they live. Um, as a veteran, as a community leader, as a San Diegan, I cannot, uh, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of passing uh, this, this board letter, and I encourage each of the supervisors to do so. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you. Our next caller is 9481. 9481, please press star six to unmute. 9481. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Luis Montella Adams. My pronouns are he, him, his. And on behalf of the San Diego LGBT Community Center, I'm calling today to urge the Board of Supervisors to approve item 20, advancing inclusion of LGBTQ plus community in San Diego County. I honestly want to start by thanking uh, Vice Chair Vargas and Supervisor Lawson Reamer for bringing this item forward today. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank the previous speakers who have spoken in support of this item. Thank you for your comments. Ensuring that the county staff have the training, tools, and resources necessary to best serve our diverse community is, a, is as critical as it, is, as it ever has been. Additional updates for internal county forms to include a non-binary uh, gender option for county staff is long overdue. And we applaud the board um, in prioritizing this update. Lastly, formalizing support for the Equality Act so we can lend our advocacy to its passing is critical not just for our county, but for this country. It is time that San Diego becomes a more welcoming place for our LGBTQ community and that it's recognized and elevated throughout the workforce. Today, the Board of Supervisors takes the critical initial step in ensuring that the LGBTQ community is supported by the county, and we look forward to continued partnerships with the Board to ensure the county comprehensively serves our LGBTQ community to the fullest. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and that concludes public comment on this item. Also note for the record that we received 11 e-comments, 10 in favor and one in opposition. All right, thank you to all the speakers who called in. We have a motion by Vice Chair Vargas, second by Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Before we vote, let me go to Supervisor Desmond. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. The, um, you know, I'm, I'm all in favor of, of uplifting the LGBTQ plus uh, community in San Diego County. However, item number two uh, in the recommend, or recommendation number two, I can't support it this time. This is in support of uh, uh, HR 5 uh, in the uh, Congress. I understand it's going to go to the Senate, and so it can be changed several times. So I'm not, uh, in, so I was wondering if we could bifurcate. I'm in favor of uh, option or recommendations one and three. But uh, I'm not. I, I can't support item uh, two today. So we have we have a we have a motion and a second. So if you want. So I guess well, is it okay from the motion maker of the motion to take item one and three and then do item two for a vote? Can I ask a question? Why? Well, I'm not What's that familiar it, yeah. with HR five yet, and I know it's still it's still in in work, and I, I'm not in the position to support it today. It would be up to the maker and the seconder if they want to do that or not. Um. So I, I don't like. really, oh, oh, sorry. you know, I don't really like doing that, but because I really want you to support this because I think it's important to our county employees, I am willing to go ahead and divide up. Well, thank you very motion. much. And it's kind of two different things you got. Here. It really isn't because we want to make sure that um, our communities have LGBTQ plus rights throughout the nation. That would be when we actually reach equity in this country. But that's a whole different conversation. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that we, everybody had enough time to read all this information and Googling the yeah. legislation would and, have been and, important. Yeah. But, but I am willing uh, to go ahead and separate it because I think it's important for our county employees to know that the supervisors um, support our LGBTQ plus community. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Second of the motion, are you okay? Um, yeah. I, will, I will agree. I'll go along with, uh, with Supervisor Vargas. I would just say, um, you know, when I think about this work, of course, it's it's vital what we do with our with our own county employees, 
Uh, but as I said, I think that to some extent, we are fortunate here. Yeah. And the real work is how do we fight for the rights of people who can't go to the bathroom, who get harassed or beaten up or worse in the hallways or in the alleys. And there's no protections. Um, and it's not just that there's no protections. It's encouraged, it's supported, it's normative. I mean, normative is the word, that it, within their communities, that that's okay. You think about, like, how did we make the big strides we've made for racial justice in this country? Um, and it's through struggles and it's through movements, um, but it's also, also through law. And you look at Brown v. Board of Education, you look at the Civil Rights Act, and you look at these incredibly important pieces of legislation and legal shifts that themselves had castigating effects on changing norms and changing expectations and changing senses of what's right and what's wrong. Um, so I will accept this bifurcation, but I have to say, um, to me, I think it's um, a lack of courage to stand up and fight for people who don't have a voice. And I think that's uh, one of the things that uh, is really important to, to me in the work that we're doing here at the county. So with that, I, I will be um, happy to hear that you would like to support pa part of this motion. I agree that's really important for our county employees. Uh, but I, I do want to put um, the movement and the work for, for justice and equality in, in a larger historical context. So thank you. Well, and so, I'm, I'm in favor of treating everyone equal. It's just HR 5 at this point in time is not something I can support. So I'm, I'm happy to move forward, and I, and I agree. We got to treat everybody, and I don't want to see anybody getting beat up or anything like that. that I think that is just in, in, you know, absurd. And, and as a society, we should not put up with that for any group at all. So I appreciate the fact of, of the bifurcation. Thank you. So sentiments are why HR 5 was uh, introduced and it's yeah. working its way through the legislature. <laughs> so let's just uh, cut equality in half here. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we'll take two different votes on equality. Before we do that, Supervisor Anderson? You know, <clears throat> uh, I think it's an important um, lesson today that we're all trying to work together and people are trying to come across, but I think that uh, Supervisor Desmond's point is that legislation isn't finished and it could be changed. And if you were basing this on something that was already passed, and we knew what we were voting on, then I think that that, uh, that would be easier to get to. But we have active legislation that could radically change, and that's not fair to a supervisor who's going into an election where it could be used as a political tool against them. Well, and I think that, uh, I think we have to stay focused on the most important thing, and that is everybody should be treated fairly and equally, and I think that that, uh, as I listen to you, Supervisor Desmond, is what I thought I heard from you, at least the way I was listening. Yeah. And I think that the more opportunities we get past grandstanding and focus on real people and lifting them and not judging them, whether it's judging a fellow supervisor or judging somebody uh, based on their personal beliefs. So uh, with that, I'd love to support this. All right, but we don't want to establish a precedent that we're opposed to voting on legislation that's not that, final because yeah. we frequently I, I, have items I brought on supervisors to yeah. support legislation that's the, not the, final. So I just want to make sure I, that's I, on I the record, say, though, because I think it's important, important to note that numerous times this body in the last six months has mm -hmm. uh, report, supported legislation that's in the process both at the state legislature and in the, oh, hold on one second, and in the House of Representatives, and I think it's our duty and responsibility to do that uh, as a governing body. So yeah. just to make clear, uh, we've done it before, and it's well, okay. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and have two motions yeah. now, and we move forward. I, I think that the difference, though, if, if I may, is that was a lone vote for lone legislation. And I, because I'm not sure I supported all of them in the past, and, and, and I'm not sure this board was unified in the past on legislation that had been fully cooked. So I, I get your point. I think it's an excellent point. I also get his point. And you know what I want to do today? I want to show my support for all people. Okay. All right. So we have a, uh, let's take a, uh, we have a motion by Supervisor uh, Vargas, seconded by Supervisor Lawson Reamer to adopt recommendations one and three of agenda item 20. Any additional comments on that? Please vote. 
Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We now have a motion by Vice Chair Vargas, seconded by Supervisor Lawson Reamer to adopt recommendation two of agenda item 20, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to express the county's support for HR 5, the Equality Act. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes with Supervisor Anderson and Supervisor Desmond voting no, all other supervisors being present and voting aye. With that, we're gonna to move to agenda item uh, 21, establishing fair employment standards on uh, county uh, construction project and county owned leased properties. Uh, I am proud to uh, bring this item forward along with Supervisor Lawson Reamer. This board has shown a commitment to our working families, uh, a commitment to tackling issues and holding our values up and putting them in principle, uh, and really a recognition that the American worker out there just wants to be treated fairly. Uh, they want a fair opportunity. They want to make sure their voice is heard, especially when it comes to publicly owned land and often taxpayer uh, inspired projects or, or often funded projects. County construction projects and businesses that operate on county owned land, I believe should held to be held to appropriate standards because they again are making use of those precious resources. The action today establishes what those uh, practices could be, including fair pay, skilled and trained workforce, adequate sick time uh, and, and other provisions in there to, uh, to give, give the, the worker out there a fair shot at what they're doing. We're directing the chief administrative officer to take the model ordinance and bring back to this board within 90 days uh, a complete ordinance for this board to consider uh, along with the possible impacts uh, surrounding those. One of those impacts I pr predict will be a uh, preservation of the middle class. So pleased to bring this item forward with Supervisor Lawson Reamer. I uh, would like to turn it to her and then we'll hear from our public speakers. Um, as you've heard me say, it's a new day at the county. This extends to county property and projects where San Diegans expect us to ensure quality jobs and quality standards to protect workers and our communities. Creating good jobs is a regional challenge and requires a regional, not a piecemeal approach. I'm pleased to bring forward this board letter today with my colleague, Chair Fletcher. This proposal pushes for a comprehensive ordinance to strengthen our local workforce and invest in San Diego families by setting strong minimum employment standards on county projects and property. As the third largest employer in the region, San Diego County has a responsibility to invest in good quality jobs to help workers across this county thrive. This ordinance will require all construction projects funded with county dollars and all projects on property leased from the county to treat employees fairly and invest in San Diego workers. Inadequate pay and poor working conditions have a significant adverse impact on the ability of working families to obtain housing and provide for families. Poverty, unemployment, and income inequality could threaten our region's economic prosperity, stability, and competitiveness. Four of the 10 largest industries in San Diego County do not pay enough for the average individual to make ends meet, with median wages less than $30,000 a year. This doesn't just impact workers. According to the National Women's Law Center, the relentless struggle to earn a living from low-wage work takes a toll on children and parents alike. Workers who are paid low wages are more likely to encounter family instability, lack childcare, experience increased stress and low self-esteem. And we know a would-be end user, Amazon, and their delivery contractor were fined in March by the California Labor Commissioner for $6.4 million in wage theft violations by our state. This action today is a start towards setting baseline standards that help families thrive and level the playing field for employers who have chosen to provide fair wages and benefits with county resources. Today, we can make a difference. This item will begin to knock down barriers and ensure individuals working on county projects or on county-owned property are paid wages that allow them to adequately provide for themselves and their families. We are talking about setting in motion a virtuous cycle of stronger families, children, and workers. If approved, this ordinance will apply to the workforce at Gillespie Field, as well as all other future construction projects, leases, and other county transactions. I wanna take a moment to emphasize in my comments that the purpose of this ordinance is to apply equitably to all future projects, including new subleases, not only new master leases. 
and I look forward to a draft ordinance, ordinance from County Council that reflects this intent. If necessary, I'd be happy to propose some language for consideration as the County Council drafts this amendment, which would be include that to a legally permissible extension would be to specify that the ordinance applies to amendments of existing contracts over which the county is exercising its discretion, whether or not they involve a term extension. So, sorry, I'm looking for my comments. Um, I think that would be sufficient to clarify that this is intended to apply equally to all new uh, leases and subleases. This is our first step to establish baseline standards, and there are certainly industries that may need higher and more specialized standards. I look forward to the work of my colleagues to address those specialized needs. So, I, Chair, fellow Chair, I think you had a motion. No, why don't we just, what, if you make a motion, I'll make and a then motion. restate the uh, addi uh, additive direction. Um, uh, so I would like to make a motion with that uh, to adopt this board letter directing County Council to develop this ordinance and urge you to vote yes to ensure the future of San Diego. And with that, a uh, question for County Council, um, do you need me to make an amendment or should I just restate my clarifying comments? I think your clarifying comments are enough. Um, we can work on the exact final language in the, in the final ordinance. Okay. But the clarifying comments will make clear this will apply to everyone. This is yes, not targeting I take it, or singling out any yeah. individual project that will take it, apply. And at least so far what the board is saying, what the maker of the motion and everybody else, um, this extension of the uh, amendments applying not just to term amendments as well as putting the equality of contracting in this ordinance, which we will do. Okay. Yeah, just to, just to uh, reiterate, uh, to emph emphasizing that the ordinance is meant to apply equitably to all future projects, including new subleases, not only master leases, um, and that we have equal treatment for all. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to second that. Uh, with that, let's go to our public speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 13 requests to speak on this item, uh, eight in favor and five individuals by phone. We'll begin with the speakers uh, in person. Any members of the public that requested to speak by phone on this item, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. I'd like to call forward Kelvin Barrios, Maribel McKenzie, Anthony Sal Salcedo, Esther Lopez, and Tom Lemon. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and County Board of Supervisors. My name is Kelvin Barrios. I am the Director of Government Affairs for Laborers International Union of North America, Local 89. I'm here representing Val Macedo, our business manager and secretary treasurer, and our over 3,800 construction, construction workers in San Diego County. We thank Supervisor Nathan Fletcher and Tara lawson Reamer for spearheading this effort, for bringing this forward today. We'd also like to thank the, the workers that are here today behind me from Laborers Local 89. This ordinance would lift, lift up the quality of life for anyone that works on development projects on county-owned property. It would also increase training requirements for such workers and ultimately provide for a better project and benefits to a local workforce. These are the type of worker-focused policies that we encourage officials across the county to enact, and today the county is paving that road. We encourage the rest of the Board of Supervisors to support this item and continue to focus on the policies that benefit working families directly. Thank you for your time. Next speaker, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Maribel McKenzie from United Food and Commercial Workers, and uh, this is for Chair Fletcher and the rest of our supervisors board. Um, just as a grocery work, as a member and a staff of political director for United Food and Commercial Workers that we represent over 12,000 members just here in San Diego County, um, one of the biggest things is our grocery members, and those are the biggest uh, members that we have. The biggest things that we do, we make sure that we fight and ensure livable wages in our region, and we want to make sure and we are requesting for the rest of our San Diego uh, to be supported. Um, as San Diego is the third largest employer in the region, where the San Diego goes, um, others will definitely follow. And we want to make sure to please, in requesting to please support this board letter to help San Diego County lead the way. It's time all jobs in the region allow workers to make ends meet. 
Um, your support on the board letter is an investment to the San Diego and our communities. So please vote yes and support this. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Anthony Salcedo, and I'm here, um, I'm a union uh, member. I've been a union member for about 17 years. I was a single father. Um, it really helped me out in having fair wages and, and um, you know, gave us, uh, gave me and my son the opportunity to have, you know, um, medical and, and everything that came w with the benefits of having a, a union. And I'm just, you know, I'm here in support. You guys hopefully, you know, approve this. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Esther Lopez. I am in support for this program. It's very important. I was a single mom as well. And um, thank, you know, I worked for Ralph's Grocery Store for over 32 years because of a living wage, because of UCW fighting for us is why I was able to make ends meet with my son and myself. So please support this. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I would like to invite the speakers in opposition to this item, Lee Chestnut and uh, Abdur Anim uh, Hamid. What a day for you folks. Uh, wow. What, what, and what a privilege to show up here this afternoon, even though I wanted to be here at 9 o'clock this morning to go hard and heavy to acknowledge my brother, David Garcias, but uh, uh, in his retirement. Tom Lemon with the San Diego Building and Construction Trades, proudly representing 35,000 union construction workers in the county. I can't tell you how proud I am of, of this board of directors, uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer, uh, my brother Nathan Fletcher, Fletcher bringing this forward. Uh, the thought of creating a space on county land, our land, that makes sure that workers are paid, paid fairly with prevailing wages, that the product that gets built on those uh, sites are using skilled and trained workforce that makes sure that they stand the test of time and we don't have problems later on down the road. But what really excites me is two things. One is to make sure that the workers have health care and coverage and all that stuff that comes along with it, but the training piece, <laughs> apprenticeships. When, when you put prevailing wage requirements on the workforce, 20% of those workers will get trained uh, through a, an apprenticeship program. They will ultimately learn the trade and be the next generation of middle class in San Diego County. You guys will be responsible for that. That is incredible. Thank you so much. Bye. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Fletcher, and to all of the supervisors here today. Uh, my name is Lee Chestnut. I'm the principal of the SGC LMC Investment Company that is under a, now a fully executed ground lease in Gillespie Field. I know that you're all aware of that. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to actually be here today in person. I, I kind of met you guys in March through uh, in the COVID world and had to do it through the Zoom. My apology for taking a little bit of time off uh, target, but this is a milestone to be here in person. Nice to meet you guys in person. Um, I, I, uh, I had some concerns when I read the proposed language of the amendment. I'm hearing um, things that are being discussed right now in front of me that have a significant um, positive impact in my understanding of the ordinance. Um, I do want to make a statement um, as to my concern, just to put it on record, that the draft ordinance, in our opinion, my opinion, uh, had language that uh, appeared to allow the county to target my project and my users with a new ordinance that would not also apply to all other county properties. And I'm requesting that the Board of Supervisors amend the proposed language to assure that my project and subtenants wouldn't be singled out in this situation. I've heard the statement, um, and I really appreciate the clarity on that. Um, I, I want to speak to the ordinance broadly and just represent that I've been around uh, the county airport's projects for my whole career. 
And I know a lot of developers in that area, and I know a lot of business owners in that area. And I'd like just to, just to speak in general that something um, like this, I think, will be of a challenge and some concern to the broad community. But thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for your willingness to consider amending it to uh, assure that we have an ordinance that is fairly applied. Sorry to overstep my bounds. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. <clears throat> The Honorable Nathan Fletcher, ladies and gentlemen of the San Diego uh, County Board of Supervisors. My name is Abdul Rahim Hamid. I'm the national president of the Black Contractors Association, a 40-year institution that have been fighting for equity and inclusion for over 40 years. I'm not here in opposition to fair and equal op e uh, employment. I think this is a good thing and it's a good move for all San Diegans. I'm concerned about the language your or of your ordinance that speaks to exclusion. In an era, a George Floyd post era that we're talking about equity and inclusion, we're seeing equity on one side and we're seeing exclusion on the other. I have the first and only African American apprenticeship program in the whole damn country in your city. And you are ruling laws and making laws to exclude us. Our apprentices graduate and they are union labor leaders. Dwight Booker is an organizer for the, car for the carpenters as a drywall person. Ibn Hamid is a carpenter foreman. They would have not gotten those opportunities had it not been for the late, great George Stevens deciding to put his money where his mouth was to build a training facility. So I'm for fair and inclusionary PLAs because you have language in here that talks about project labor agreements. Well, what does that mean to the, to the Black Contractors Association, the BIPOC, BIPOC community, that the numbers show that we are not getting representation? We're not anti-union, we're pro-inclusion. I am a trade unionist myself. So I'm here today to tell you that I'm asking you to come back to the table to the real people that it matters and have this discussion. And don't just take something because the old standard of PLA is a, is a racistly exclusive program that have excluded African Americans in large numbers and it, it excludes the National Association of Black Contractors Apprenticeship Program that's federal and state approved just like everybody else. So let's get, back, get past the chicanery and deal with the real reality. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from those who requested to speak by phone. We'll be calling speakers by the last four digits of their phone number. You'll hear notification that your call has been unmuted. You will then need to press star six to unmute your phone. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record and also please mute your TV live video stream before you begin speaking. And if you could please identify the first caller. Our first speaker is 6770-6770. Please press star six to unmute. Hi, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Rick Bates with Unite Here Local 30, uh, the Hotel and Hospitality Workers Union. And uh, we would just like to comment and say that we're really excited to see this board letter come forward. Um, you know, it, it, it's time for workers to be at the center of the equity conversation, equity and pay, equity and opportunity. Um, for many years, Unite Here has led this uh, campaign that one job should be enough. And um, we know that workers uh, are often forgotten in these conversations unless they make themselves known. And so it's time for our region to set you know, a real standard for how workers can fare. We need to invest in our region's workforce. And so setting you know, baseline standards for families to thrive, that's very important. We just want to say we're, we're in full support of this. And thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you. Our next speaker is 0780. 0780. Please press star six to unmute. Good afternoon, Chairman Fletcher and board members. This is Doug Hicks with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. County assets should benefit the community. If these assets are made available to a developer, they will gain generational levels of wealth through the acquisition of these properties. Asking those developers to reinvest in the communities they will profit from is both reasonable and it's appropriate. As a resident of, uh, of the County of San Diego and a constituent of Joel Anderson, I'm excited to see this come forward. It's a huge step creating community wealth, grow our middle class, and it's an opportunity to work in the areas that we grew up in. With that, I urge your support today. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 3009-3009. Please press star six to unmute. 
Good afternoon. My name is Bridget Browning, and I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Labor Council, and I am here um, in support of item number 21, and that we are encouraging you to vote yes. Um, I really want to thank Chair Fletcher and Supervisor Lawson Reamer for taking the time to address something that's been an issue in San Diego for my entire career. Um, you really should be using county resources to lift people out of poverty into the middle class, and I'm so, so proud that you are setting the example for the rest of the cities in the county. By ensuring that there's prevailing wage and a skilled and trained workforce on county construction projects and county-owned leases, you are ensuring that workers are being paid fairly with area standard wages. The buildings that are being constructed with public tax dollars or being built on public land will meet the standards of high-quality construction, like skilled and trained workers who have graduated from the state certified apprenticeship program. And you're also ensuring these projects will provide opportunities for current apprentices in state registered apprenticeship programs to build the pipeline for our next generation of skilled and trained construction workers and lift people into the middle class where everyone should have a right to be. So thank you so much. I, I urge you to vote yes. And that concludes public comment on this item. Also note for the record that we received 15 e-comments on this item, 11 in favor and three in opposition. Thank you. A um, couple quick comments. One for Mr. Chestnut is here. Again, we made clear this will apply equally and evenly. Uh, and when this uh, draft ordinance comes back as an actual ordinance, we will make sure that is explicitly spelled out to, uh, to make sure your, your, your concerns are addressed. Uh, second thing is there, there's no language in this uh, draft ordinance surrounding project labor agreements. Uh, your complaints about those, there may be a day for you to come down here and complain about those, but that, that day is not today. Um, but, uh, and then third, to our, uh, our friends in, in organized labor and labor unions, thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, I view you as allies. Uh, I believe we're here to support uh, the middle class, support basic fairness for American workers. Uh, and so we appreciate all that you do and are pleased to bring this forward, uh, item forward uh, in an effort to try and further uh, that basic issue of fairness to the middle class. So with that, uh, we have a motion and a second. Let me go to my colleagues. We'll go to Supervisor Anderson, Supervisor Vargas, and then Supervisor Wasson Reamer, starting with you, Supervisor Anderson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, uh, I totally support stronger families higher wages, allowing people to provide for their families and, and uh, achieving the pride that can only come from providing for one's family. The area around that project is at 10.4 unemployment, the highest in the county, greater than any of your other districts in unemployment. It's a green project. Uh, they're gonna be carbon free, but they're dedicated to being carbon free. The community is the largest area of SB 535 underserved as defined by the California legislature. The, the project, if it moves forward the way it is, it's going to lower our VMT. It's going to have a huge impact. Right now, uh, all packages don't come anywhere close from East County, but instead we have 200 vehicles coming from South Bay and other areas flooding into this area. And we're never going to stop people from ordering online. We're just not nor should we have tried to. So with that in mind, I'd like for you to consider an amendment, and this is what I'm proposing, that the Working Family Ordinance be reviewed by the Office of Evaluation, Performance, and, and, and Analytics in the Office of Equity and Racial Justice to determine the outcome of the ordinance and what it would have on this disparage, despairing area. It's not fair for us to be a high in polluting if we're denying families an ability to provide for their families. These are hundreds of jobs potentially to these poor communities where uh, the jobs are in their backyard. They can literally walk to the jobs. And so uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. I just think that this is a huge, bold step and that we should do it with balance and use the departments that we've created that we said are designed to ask these questions and to ensure that we're getting the outcome that we anticipate. It would be horrible if we moved forward and that we forced people to continue with county assistance when they want to provide for their own families. 
and I just want to make sure that we give every opportunity to those people to be lifted in their community and every opportunity for them to provide for their families with the potential of a high paying job. And look, I agree with what you're trying to accomplish and I want to be there, but we have two new departments that their input is crucial at this time to give us the positive feedback. But you know, this is, these are communities of color. You know, when you go into El Cajon, yeah, we've talked about this before, but I just want to reiterate it. They were told to, to mark on their census Caucasian. They are not Caucasian. They have been stepped on all the way through. These refugees deserve to be treated equally and with respect. And what I'm concerned about is that we're not, we're going to be so eager to, to ring the bell that we're going to lose track. It's not about bells, it's about lifting people. And so I, I want to support this today, but I'd like for you uh, to take as an amendment, uh, just referring it to those two offices and getting their feedback when they come back in 90 days. Let me ask our, uh, our CAO quickly, could we do that in the 90 day period? We could certainly do it with the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. We'll do our best to get it with the uh, Chief Evaluation Officer. We have not yet hired that person. We're in the process of doing that and also uh, hiring a consultant. Uh, 90 days is a little bit um, challenging, but we will do our very best to do that. But we, we certainly can with the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. That is up and running and has been now for about six months or, or longer. Mr. Chair, I'd be willing to accept uh, Office of Racial Justice and to the extent they, they can in the uh, Office of Evaluation, Performance and Analytics. I, I don't want to hold this up, Got it. but if they have some input, some input's better than none. Got it. Yeah. Supervisor Wasserman. I actually just want to make a quick comment. Yeah, absolutely, uh, as long as we're not holding this up, um, I think my concern is we want to move forward expeditiously uh, and we don't delay, uh, but I would be happy to accept the amendment with the clarity that uh, this is not going to delay implementation of the ordinance. It's sort of to the extent feasible within uh, the 90 days allotted. Uh, and you know, I just want to say uh, to Supervisor Anderson, um, there's a lot of research sort of globally on um, sort of the impacts on economies and uh, working and unemployment of low wage jobs and when you depress wages um, what happens to the local communities um, and there's we've had studies and studies and studies on this over the last 50 years looking at development trajectories from uh, Mexico to East Asia uh, globally and you know, I think the data is very clear that when you pay workers poorly you can't grow your local economy you trap people in cycles of poverty and you can't uh, in, you can't invest in the human capital that we need to build a strong middle class. Um, so my position on this is not only uh, rooted in you know respect and solidarity for working families in theory, but is rooted in 50 years of data on how you build strong economies locally and globally. So with that being said, I think it's a great idea. Let's look at it here, as long as that we're not holding up implementation of an ordinance that's so important for people in our communities. Okay, so we presently have a, a motion uh, by Supervisor Wasserman Reamer, seconded by myself, to approve the recommendations one and two, adding one D, which would be uh, ask the Office of Racial Justice and Equity, and to the extent possible, the Office of Evaluations and Analytics to comment, uh, or not, not comment, to review these items before they return to board meetings. Uh, Vice Chair Vargas. Um, so I just want to, uh, on the record, say that I, I think it's really interesting that in the fifth largest economy in the world, we are still having to create legislation and policies to support good jobs and fair wages for people who deserve it. And so um, I'm happy to support it because I think it's our responsibility to set standards in how we treat people who are working on our county projects and on our county property. I think it behooves us to do that. So I'm happy to stand with my colleagues in supporting this initiative. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Anderson's uh, uh, efforts here in, in having this uh, heard by our committees that we've set up and, and uh, uh, having them uh, part of the uh, part of the discussion. I, I do have a few concerns on this, and I'm, I'm okay with supporting it moving forward. But you know, airport, a lot of our county land is on airports, and airports are, are unique. They're not just, uh, you know, there's some businesses that really have no other choice other than to be on an airport, especially with airport operations, airport maintenance, support, uh, flying clubs, mom and pop uh, businesses, things like that. And it looks like this ordinance is gonna carry to any leaseholder on that airport. And so um, 
I just want to be cautious moving forward that, you know, uh, companies, you know, that are leasing uh, land from us that uh, on, on airport that are not airport business um, are, are kind of ripe for this uh, type of, um, for this type of uh, um, ordinance, but not all businesses on, on the airport are. So I just like in, in coming back in, in 90 days, the con some consideration being made to those uh, facilities that are there that really have no other choice than to be at an airport, whereas these other re you know, kind of retail uh, commercial type businesses um, that are not airport specific uh, may be more of the uh, target for this ordinance. So I just have concerns with operators that are there on site and got nowhere else to go. Got it. Uh, you good? I just, I saw your name and I didn't know if it was from earlier. I just wanted to thank everyone who came out and uh, spent your day here. I uh, really appreciate uh, you being part of our democratic process and making sure that voices that honestly have been really marginalized in our county for really a generation are uh, here and present. And um, it's really an honor to, to be able to fight with you for fairness for working families in our, in our region and our community. So thank you for being here. Supervisor Anderson. I, I'd just like to uh, I, I, uh, finish and, and thank Supervisor Vargas because I, I agree with you 100%. And one of the uh, biggest disappointments I had as a legislator is that uh, many of those in the majority party would brag about the economic engine of California, but they'd never speak to the one in five, the 20% of Californians that lives below the poverty line. We have the highest poverty in the nation. And we have one party rule, and I'm not saying anything other, but we have one party rule that controls everything. And I think often we lose track and we're thinking about ringing the bell and forget about the people. And what I love about your comments was I agree with you. Nobody deserves to live the way we've allowed people to live. And I swore when I was going to get elected again that I would always fight for them more than I ever did before. Because when you go through Al Cajon, you go through Spring Valley, and you look at an SB 535 community, and we're, we're saying, well, we know what the best job is for you, and that is no job. And that's what we did to Central Valley. We took away all their jobs. And all these poor people were denied. You know, there's over 2,000 communities that didn't have potable water. And I ran a bill to, to give them potable water. And all I could get out of it was 500 communities because they said, well, they need to build their own water plant. These are unemployed people. How are they going to build a water plant? And so that's all I'm trying to say is, look, I want to get there. I agree with what you're saying. And I just think that we need to make sure that we don't step, along, step on the little people while we're trying to lift. We have to lift everybody. It's got to be a tide for everyone. It can't be a tide for some. So thank you for your support of this. Uh, thank you, motion maker and second, uh, for accepting it. I really appreciate it, and I'm eager to vote for it. All right, I would guess that 20%, uh, one in five are not skilled and trained, uh, don't get paid prevailing wage. So I think the things we're doing here are a good, good step towards, uh, towards addressing that issue. Uh, with that, we have a uh, motion uh, by Supervisor Wasserman, seconded Chair, by Mr. Myself. Mr. Chair, can I ask, um, is the direction net to draft part with regard to specialized airport businesses? Should we no. bring back that? No. Okay, thank no. you. That's a concern. Thank you. That's Supervisor Desmond's concern. So it's to adopt as written in the board letter recommendations one and two, adding a recommendation D to ask the Office of Equity and Racial Justice and to the extent possible the Office of Data Analytics to review this before it comes back uh, in 90 days. With that, please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. All right, we're gonna to move to uh, agenda item 22, cost benefit analysis of in-home supportive services, IHSS compared to institutional placements, an item brought forward by Supervisor Austin Reamer. or we'll hear first from the uh, Supervisor Austin Reamer, and then we'll go to public speakers. Um, yes, so thank you very much uh, for everyone's uh, patience in our meeting today. Every San Diego County resident deserves the dignity and respect of being able to live in their homes. IHSS is the cornerstone of making this happen for thousands of people across the region. Aging in place in the home is by far the best practice and the preferred option. Uh, this action comes at a time when we're confronting the fact that our population is aging. By the end of this decade, one in, one in four Californians will be older adults. 
For many, we are already affected by this reality, either caring for a loved one ourselves or hiring someone to help. One way or another, all of us likely need some form of care, either from a family member, friends, or another caregiver. We recognize the work of San Diego's in-home supportive services workers this morning. There's a lot of people providing the service, but the reality is that this number falls short. We will soon face a labor shortage of up to 3.2 million paid direct care workers. The alternative is that seniors, disabled, and other populations that require constant care will have to leave their homes to enter a skilled nursing facility or rely more heavily on government programs. The purpose of the action today is to get ahead of the silver tsunami. The first step I'm proposing is a cost-benefit analysis of in-home supportive services compared to the alternative of institutional care, such as skilled nursing homes. As we change the way business is done at the county, we focus more and more on data and analytics. This study will give us the data we need to make informed and proactive decisions about where and how to invest our resources to prepare for the graying of our population. With that, I would like to make a motion to support this analysis so we can get ready for our region's future. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Mr. Vargas? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, second the motion. Uh, the only question or clarification I wanted to ask um, the uh, maker of the motion is um, the evaluation that just came down from the state, we want to make sure that that's included in that process, right? But I didn't, I don't know that I saw it and I didn't have a chance to ask it beforehand, so I apologize. For that. No, it's a great, no, it's a great question. Um, this is meant to build on that evaluation. Okay. So uh, that evaluation was uh, statewide. Yep. And we want to do an analysis that's specific to San Diego. Uh, because not only do we have a difference um, in terms of our population dynamics, we also have specificity around what kinds of facilities are available here locally, okay. as well as pay uh, for our local IHSS workers. Okay, with that, I'm happy to make the second. All right, let's go to our public speakers on this item. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have four requests to speak on this item, uh, three in person and one by phone. Also note for the record that we received two e-comments, both in favor. Any members of the public that requested to speak by phone on this item, please dial in at the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. I'd like to invite forward the individuals in favor of this item, Martha Ranian and uh, Roberto Velasquez. And that'll be followed by the speaker in opposition to this item, Audra Morgan. You'll have two minutes to address the board and please begin by stating your name for the audio record. Hello, my name is Marta Rañón and I'm the Executive Vice President of Southern Caregiver Resource Center. Uh, Chairman Fletcher, members of the Board of Supervisors, thank you so much for bringing to light the concerns and the challenges that many caregivers face. As uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer stated, we are aging and we are going to be having needs that are beyond what we are able to provide at the moment. And so it brings me, uh, it brings me great pressure to be able to talk about this subject and really address some of those concerns. Um, we know that the demographics of the family caregiver are changing. We have always assumed that the uh, face of the family caregiver is one who is a retired senior caring for their spouse, but we know that that is changing, that we are seeing more and more younger adults uh, caring for their parents, also caring for their children. Um, in San Diego County alone, we are seeing a change. We are seeing that it is the face of a 49-year-old woman caring for her elderly parents while also working outside the home at least 20 hours. Um, that is a lot to bear, and especially during this time of balancing work, um, life, and school, and now caregiving. Um, I, you're going to hear from my colleagues some more statistics, but I wanted to share my personal story. I was a family caregiver at in my 30s, and I was caring for my great aunt, who was elderly and frail. I was not working 20 hours uh, outside the home. I was working full time while also having my first baby. So caring for her was very, very difficult, not only physically, but emotionally. So I connected with Southern 
Caregiver Resource Center, and they gave me uh, a lot of the services that I was able to utilize to benefit the situation. I was able to um, really acquire a lot of skills to care for my great aunt, but we also connected with IHSS. And because of that, she was able to get Thank someone you. to take care of her at home, which Thank was you. so greatly needed. Thank, Thank you. Your time you. is up. Next speaker, please. Hello, um, my name is Roberto Velasquez, and I'm the president and CEO of Southern Caregiver Resource Center, or SCRC, and I want to thank Chairman uh, Fletcher and the board for allowing me to come and take a few minutes and speak here. And I'm here in support of Supervisor Lawson Reamer's proposal of the cost analysis of the IHSS program, comparing it to institutional care in San Diego County. We at SCRC know the importance of long-term care services and support for our aging population and people with disabilities. Since 1987, SCRC has been the leading provider of free comprehensive caregiver support services, helping thousands of families every year, providing assessments, helping them assess their needs, developing care plans, providing ongoing case management, education, training, support groups, counseling, and very important respite services to give them a much needed break. With over 490,000 family caregivers in San Diego County, uh, providing over 600 million hours of unpaid care, which is about $9.8 billion a year, family caregivers are the backbone of our health care system. We know that many, if not the majority of IHSS workers are family caregivers themselves. And the data shows that at least half of all caregivers provide care to loved ones with complex medical conditions, including Alzheimer's or related dementias. And if they were not getting that support at home, they would be in a nursing home. San Diego County has been a leader in supporting family caregivers with data-driven and evidence-based programs. The IHSS cost analysis will help inform policy that support our most vulnerable of populations moving us another step forward in creating an aging and dementia-friendly community. With that, I just want to say thank you for your time and support. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello again. Um, I'm Audra Morgan. So I have actually been a caregiver before, and I've also needed care myself. Um, and. So I understand the importance of it and how hard it is, but my concern is that we're preparing for the older generation to get help, but what about, are we also preparing for adverse things that are going on with this vaccine that could be years down the road where younger people are going to need care that they didn't once need? And how can we prepare to um, just for older people and things like that, I feel like there, there's a whole lot of missing um, uh, care that we're, I don't even know, I'm not speaking right here, but um, I'm just concerned that we're setting up for something and, and there's gonna be a need for more than just older people to have care. And we're not doing anything to stop that. I mean, you can't stop people from aging, but if there's something that is causing the public to possibly be sick and need care in home or in an institution, why can't we do something to prevent that as well? I mean, you don't know that it's not going to happen. You can't say that it will necessarily either, but if there are things going on with these vaccines that are causing autoimmune diseases and, and different disabilities, people are gonna need care in the future. And, and so it's just concerning that we're not even addressing that. Um, and so I know it's important, this care. I'm not trying to say that it's not something that we should have, but I think about, we need to think about why we have it and who's gonna need it, not just older people. We'll now hear from those individuals that requested to speak by phone. Uh, we'll be calling you by the last four digits of your phone number. You'll hear a notification that your call has been unmuted. You'll then need to press star six to unmute your line. We'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record and remind you to mute your TV or live video stream. We'll begin with the last four digits, 7451. 7451, please press star six to unmute your line. We 
If not, we'll come back to you. Uh, 3009, 3009, please press star six to unmute your line. Um, hi, this is Bridget Browning from the Labor Council again. I am calling in support of item number 21, and I really want to thank you for bringing forward um, the in-home health workers, which are often the lowest paid workers doing maybe the hardest job there is. It happens. Um, and so we really appreciate you trying to uplift their, their hard work and try to help them have more dignity in the future. So thank you. We'll come back to 7451, 7451. Please press star six to unmute your line. Seeing no movement from that caller, Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Uh, let me go to my colleagues, see if there's any comments or questions. Not seeing any, we have a uh, motion by Supervisor Lawson Reamer, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas to approve the uh, recommendations in item 22. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We're gonna move to agenda item 25, County of San Diego and San Diego County Schools Direct Tax and Revenue Anticipation Note Program expiring 2021. Uh, I don't believe we have a uh, staff presentation on this item. We do? Okay. We'll go and uh, hear uh, some comments from Ebony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Fletcher, members of the board. Um, my comments today are being made in accordance with Government Code Article 2, Deposit of Funds, Section 53635.7, which states that in making any decision that involves borrowing in the amount of $100,000 or more, the legislative body of a local agency shall discuss, consider, and deliberate each decision as a separate item of business on the agenda of its meeting. To manage its cash flow needs, the county has historically issued annual tax and revenue anticipation notes, or TRANS, along with participating school districts. The county will not issue a TRANS at this time, but in support, the county will coordinate the series 2021 TRANS on behalf of the school districts. The repayment of the notes will be the responsibility of the participating school districts. At this time, there are anticipated to be five participating school districts borrowing an aggregate amount not to exceed $119 million. I recommend approval for the county to execute the series 2021 TRAN program on behalf of the local school districts. And this concludes my comments. All right, uh, with that, let's go to our, uh, any public speakers uh, interested in commenting on uh, San Diego County School District tax revenue bonds. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have one request to speak in opposition to this item. I'd like to invite forward Audra Morgan. You'll have two minutes to address the board. Hello, um, Audra Morgan. Uh, I guess I'm concerned as to why the schools have to borrow this money and pay it back because, I mean, we spent almost $700 million on COVID. Why, why are the schools suffering? Why do they, why can't funds go to them? I mean, what happened to the $31 billion that was supposed to go to schools? Um, just wondering. I mean, and then we're spending all this money to vaccinate people, but what about the children? I mean, you know, when when the, do they matter in any of this? I feel like we're trying to to um, be equal and and all this, and we throw around these words, but then really, when it comes to it, it's not really happening. I mean, I'm not sure what we need to do to get on the ally side of things, where people want to work with us. Um, but it's just concerning that you're you're making these schools do that when when you could take. I mean, I don't know, the 4.5 million that you're just about to spend on COVID to continue these vaccinations to go to schools. I mean, I, I don't understand why you're making them borrow the money and pay it back. That just, I mean, does that make sense to you all? I mean, that it does. I mean, why are we leaving so many people behind in this? And, and they're left to suffer. I mean, they, they, you know, they can't even speak for themselves and, and come and, and tell you things that they want, but people come here and they tell you, I mean, you should be more concerned about the schools than you are. I mean, where does, I mean, we have buckets of money everywhere. Well, the bucket here, bucket there. I mean, 
do you just find money and decide where you're going to put? I feel like we you, you talk about it like it's pay, like not even real. I mean, like it's monopoly money. And it's just sad. It's it's really sad because you're supposed to be speaking for the people, doing what the people want. Thank you. And I just feel like that's not happening unless you're an ally of Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Your time is up. And that concludes public comment on this item. I'll make a motion to approve the recommendations on item 25. Is there a second? Second by Vice Chair Vargas. Uh, any comments or questions? Seeing none, please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting on. We're going to go to agenda item 29, general services approve uh, execution of an option to purchase agreement with Caltrans of approximately 18.49 acre parcel uh, in North County. Uh, let me go first. I believe staff have some uh, comments they would like to make on this item, uh, and then we'll hear from any public speakers and return to the board. Thank you. We do have Marco Medved with the Department of General Services here to provide a staff presentation. So I'll turn it over to Marco. Hey, good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. Um, I'm Marco, Director of General Services, and I have Chris Thibodeau here with the Sheriff's Department. They were presenting a, a request for your board to consider authorizing the county to enter into an option purchase agreement with Caltrans for the potential purchase of an approximately 18.5 acre parcel located in the unincorporated community of Bonzel for the proposed sheriff station alongside the Interstate 15 corridor uh, where 15 and 76 uh, connect together. The approximate 18.5 acre Caltrans parcel is located southwest of the uh, 1576 connection and has an immediate access to I-15, Highway 76, and the old Highway 395, making it an ideal centralized location. Caltrans uh, just notified county staff that the parcel was declared excess to Caltrans needs and uh, of its intention to dispose of the parcel. As part of its disposal process, Caltrans offered the county with the opportunity to acquire the parcel prior to disposing it of it by other means. And Chris Thibodeau will now present the need for the sheriff's station uh, on the reference parcel. Good afternoon. The, uh, the need for this station was first identified in the 2005 uh, master planning study. Uh, we did a revised study in 2020, and this, excuse me, the proposed 37,000 square foot station would serve a staff of 154 and provide community rooms and other functions to support uh, engagement. It would actually carve parts of four other stations, Fallbrook, Vista, San Marcos, and Valley Center, which covers most of the unincorporated uh, areas there, and realign them into a new command area. Uh, we anticipate a forward, a forward fleet site, a location for one of our Astra helicopters, mobile command, emergency planning, and search and rescue assets to better support the North County region. The proposed station is currently in the SENA for fiscal year 25-26 and would cost approximately $44.5 million. The acquisition and pre-construction is scheduled in the prior year in FY 24-25. But Caltrans has just declared this um, parcel surplus, and because we have been talking to them over the past several years, they are offering us the option to purchase before they put it out um, on the market. So today's recommendations are to, to find that the approval to enter into an option agreement for the potential purchase of this land is an administrative action and not approval of a project as defined by CEQA. And we ask the board to authorize the Director of General Services to sign the option purchase agreement with Caltrans to place a one-year hold on the 18.5 acre parcel by approving the option consideration payment of $321,400. Entering, entering into the option agreement with Caltrans will allow county staff to conduct due diligence and start prelim preliminary planning for the proposed sheriff station on this parcel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, thank you from the Sheriff's Department. Let me ask the clerk if we have a request to speak on this item. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have five requests to speak uh, by phone on this item. Also note for the record that we received three e-comments. Uh, all three of those were in opposition. 
Uh, we'll hear from those that requested to speak by phone. Any individuals that uh, submitted a request to speak by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll be calling speakers by the last four digits of your phone number. You'll hear a notification that your call has been unmuted. You will then need to press star six to unmute your line. We'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record and remind you to please mute your TV or live video stream before you begin speaking. And if you could please identify the callers. Our first caller is 3280. 3280, please press star six to unmute. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Felipe Rios. I am the Chief Program Officer for Interfaith Community Services. Interfaith Community Services supports Supervisor Lawson Reamer's desire to build permanent supportive housing for justice involved individuals. I, I, I think you're commenting on the wrong item. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not sure what item that would be. 32. 32 I have some comments maybe. on this that might clarify, but it definitely don't have a motion around any kind of permanent support of housing. Okay. I'll tell you what, what that's number 32. You're talking about, I think you're talking about item 32. So we're going to get there pretty, well, reasonably quickly here. So would you like to call back in on 32? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. Our next speaker is 4692. 4692, please press star six to unmute. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Christine Lopez, and I'm the volunteering resource coordinator with Think Dignity. Think Dignity is a homeless advocacy agency here in San Diego. Um, I uh, Think Dignity supports Supervisor Lawson Reamer's desire to analyze alternative housing options um, for individuals that have impact, been impacted by the criminal justice system. Experts in re-entry list access to stable housing as among the most difficult barriers for people with convictions. Stable housing, like employment, is strongly correlated with reduced recidivism and increased capacity for people with convictions to become contributing members of society. When people with convictions are barred from housing, they lose out on opportunities that can help to support their employment, health, family reunification and community inclusion, and their likelihood of recidivism increases. As a result, individuals re-entering after incarceration become entrenched in poverty and fall into homelessness. Nationally, an estimated 25 to 50 percent of people who are homeless were formerly incarcerated. A recent study showed that the housing assistance programs are the re-entry services most likely to show positive outcomes for people with convictions, particularly those packaged with supported services such as job training and health, health services. San Diego has a crucial opportunity to invest in what we value and demonstrate our commitment to our people. We have a responsibility to support re-entry programs that are data-driven and proven to have effective outcomes, allowing our communities to thrive and flourish. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is 2632. 2632, please press star 6 to unmute. 2632, please press star 6 to unmute. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Growett. I'm an attorney with the Office of Public Defenders. Um, I support Supervisor Lawson Reamer's desire to build permanent of housing for justice-involved individuals. Stable housing is the first step to assisting any individual in rebuilding their lives. Once housed, individuals can seek their employment, medical and mental health treatment, disorder treatment, and further their skills or education. The challenge today for many individuals, as I've seen um, in my profession, being released from custody is a lack of affordable housing and housing that does not discriminate against them because of their criminal record. This, combined with discriminatory employment practices, leads them to feeling discouraged and hopeless. Hope is an important part of the recovery process. This is what a stable home and supportive services provides. Uh, without a permanent supportive housing option, many formerly incarcerated individuals will end up homeless and on the streets of San Diego. They will qu quickly lose hope for changing their circumstances and return to the lifestyle that led to their incarceration, keeping them in this cycle of incarceration that many of our clients see. Um, we know county is well positioned to end the revolving door for so many individuals. If we continue to release individuals to the street without services that can incite hope in a new way of thinking, we are only doing the same thing we have always done, expecting a different outcome. I believe that every life is important. Everyone deserves the opportunity to be successful and live their best life as contributors to their families and our communities. 
Supportive housing is arguably the most important piece in the reentry puzzle. It provides a stable place and the appropriate support these community members need to launch their new life. Um, it is crucial and San Diego has the opportunity to ensure that we end the cycle of incarceration for many of our clients. Um, and I support providing laws or women's desire um, for alternate use of um, this property. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on uh, item 32 for those callers. Okay, thank you to all the uh, callers who called in. We'll go to Supervisor Desmond and then Supervisor Watson Raymer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for our sheriff's representative, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Chris Thibodeau, sir. Chris, Mr. Simmons? Thibodeau. Thibodeau, oh, that wasn't even close. Mr. Thibodeau. Um, so thank you very much for the uh, information. Um, my staff asked earlier, one of the concerns in North County was that we were not going to close the San Marcos Vista or Fallbrook substation. So in your uh, presentation, I thought I heard you say they, that, that, we, that was going to be the case. So We're going to realign staff and create a new command area under a captain. One of the issues with those, sta those four stations in particular uh, is they're almost undersized to meet the needs of the communities they serve. Okay. And as we start to build more toward the Riverside County line, uh, Sandag estimates another 100,000 um, people by 2030. We're now pulling people out of beat areas and possibly increasing response times. So we first identified the need for a new command area as far back as 2005. And as I said, we validated the need again in 2020. Okay, are you gonna close the San Marcos Valley or Vista no, and Fallbrook not, substations? Not closing okay, the thing. Okay, perfect, that's all Just I want. <laughs> a new station and a new command area. Okay. Um, when it comes to response times, especially for the rural and, and unincorporated, we're, we're basically you know, hitting the, the, the upper limit of the band. Mm -hmm. And as we start to grow more into the rural and unincorporated areas, uh, we're afraid we won't be able to meet our response time goals. Uh, okay. essentially well, creating underserved communities. Well, great, so thank you very much. I, I just want to get that clarification, and thanks. I think this is a great uh, feature for uh, North County, particularly as, I don't know, Sandy says we're gonna grow, but we'll see how much uh, new housing goes up there. Uh, the uh, station's gonna feature, you know, a fleet side, an Astria helicopter pad, uh, I also heard uh, mobile command center, emergency planning, search and rescue assets to better support the North County region. So I wanna say thank you very much for this effort. I think it is much needed. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve item uh, 29. Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Desmond, seconded by Supervisor Anderson. Supervisor Lawson Riemer. Um, I have a couple comments, uh, but I just first wanna start with a clarifying question. Uh, so the 300,000 um, for the option, is it for one year option or a two year option? It is a one year option. We have the option for a second year option, which will then be 10% of the new appraised value. Right now the current appraised value is 3.2 million and change. So we have to exercise that option within a year or we pay again? Yes. Correct. Okay, that was my understanding as well. I am. I think that's a lot of money. Um, I also just wanna <clears throat> I sort of put out there that the end result of the kind of path we're going on would be $44.5 million for a new station. And I mean, I'll be honest, when I sort of look around at the needs in our county, um, I'm not convinced that that is the biggest need that we have in our county, uh, either within public safety specifically or across the board in general in terms of you know demands on our scarce resources. So um, I, I've been in conversations with a lot of stakeholders and what I was hoping is that there would be a path forward to, um, to move with the option uh, but to ask staff to, instead of, uh, instead of moving forward to uh, purchase the land, the parcel for um, a substation, instead to ask staff to come back uh, in 90 days with an assessment, or it could be 120, I don't have a particular number, I would take guidance from Helen, um, about other pot potential uh, uses of that land. Um, I'm particularly concerned about a couple things. Uh, first of all, is I think as we look at uh, development patterns in our county. I am not convinced that we're gonna be building um, the density in that region that we need uh, to justify a nearly you know, $45 million investment. Um, doesn't seem like the best use of funds and I don't know that we have the density to support it and, we, uh, and I don't see that we necessarily will have the density to support that. I think that needs to be revisited, not just in light of RENA projections, which we all know don't actually translate into houses, Arena numbers are aspirational, not actual homes. Um, the other issue I think is very clearly that we have a lot of other 
um, alternatives to incarceration that we should be exploring that are important investments, including, as some of the callers mentioned, um, I think that those, those callers uh, came out of some conversations I had had with, um, with members of the community uh, regarding what else do we need, what's missing, like what, what are the big facilities that are missing in our county, uh, one of them being permanent supportive housing, um, you know, others being uh, safe haven housing. Um, so I think that there's a number of other possibilities on how this, uh, this land could be used. And so I just want to make sure we're doing what we need to do to make the best use of the site and any future sites, the other future sites the county acquires. Uh, so I would um, not be in support of uh, the motion today uh, to move forward with the option to purchase the parcel to u for use as a, su as a substation. But I would support uh, moving forward with the option to purchase the site uh, with uh, the direction um, for county staff to return back with an assessment of uh, and, uh, an evaluation of different potential uses that the site could be put to. Um, the substation could be one of many things considered. So, Supervisor Wasserman, are you offering a friendly amendment to the maker and the seconder to add a fourth recommendation to uh, ask for a review of all possible utilizations of the site? Um, Sure, I'd be happy to formulate it like that. I think just uh, to review all possible formulations of the site, uh, uses of the site, uh, and not assume uh, that it will be a substation. Okay. Yes, the, oh, go ahead. Helen. Thank you, Supervisor. I was just curious, um, would it be acceptable to you for us to come back as part of our capital improvement needs assessment plan and look at potential sources of other usage at that point in time? Uh, and when would that be? Uh, we'll be bringing forward <clears throat> we're, we're starting that process now. We're just kicking it off. We typically bring it back before budget. So we'll we start in August with uh, touch points with you in December and March. That would be a, a great idea. That would be a very, think, very strategic, it would, but it's part of a larger planning process. Thank and, you. And then we'll put it into <laughs> yes. this, this money into a capital uh, account. Ebony, we can do that technically. We can just add it into a... a um, a non-specific capital account exactly. and then include that in our SENA planning. Ebony? Sorry. The appropriations will go into the capital project um, that's established for the acquisition of this parcel at, at this time as it's established. That in no way will prohibit the use of this land um, for other activities. If we don't move forward with this particular capital project, um, the amount that we have that we're going to expense just won't be capitalized. Sorry, explain that further. So it would be yeah. in an account that is allocated for this particular project? That's correct. But if we don't actually move forward with the capital pro project itself, um, then we will cancel the capital project and just record this as an expense. But we need a mechanism to actually move forward with paying for the option provision that's listed here um, from an accounting perspective. And to reallocate that out of that account and into a different project, if uh, would that require three votes or four votes at a future time? So to cancel the appropriation that's in this existing capital project would be just a simple majority vote. Um, if we were to record the expense in a different capital project, we would have to establish appropriations there, and that would be a four vote item. Along with the funding for whatever the project is that we'd be coming forward with. Four and votes if it was done outside of the budget agency. Budget. That's that, right. that would be done for even the capital project going forward. That's right. If, if you were going forward as a share of substation, that would also be a four vote item because you'd have to appropriate the funding for all of that at, at, right. at okay. that point. That's so helpful. whatever project you decide to do on this property, uh, by having this, you would have a uh, an option to purchase the full 18 and a half acre parcel and use it for whatever purpose you would want at a later time, that purpose would require a four vote item at the time that you would appropriate the funds to purchase. Okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I think the, the major point is I appreciate your, your guidance, uh, Helen, that it would make sense to uh, come back in the SENA process with a recommendation as opposed to on an ad hoc way. So that would be my friendly amendment if the, if the mover of the motion would accept it. Well, okay, I so I, I, I want to make clear what, your, what the amendment is. Just one, one, one second, Supervisor Desmond. I don't think, and I'll ask Helen to clarify, I think we could adopt this as written, but we still have the decision point as a board to determine we're not buying the property. No, I understand, so, but I wanted to make that amendment as you outlined, the fourth uh, item that uh, then directed staff to come back to, to do an assessment of other potential uses and come back with a report back to the board as part of the SENA process. Okay. 
we yeah. would, and, and based on this motion, uh, as written, this recommendation, we could allocate it specifically to the purchase of this property and not tie it to the specific project. So, Does that okay, that, your that, this wouldn't have any substantive difference. Okay, that, I'd be I'd be I'd be fine with that. Uh, however, I will argue that uh, we're still right now. Currently, we're building hundreds of homes at the uh, intersection of the 15 and 76 is where this is actually located. And Valley Center is already building a bunch of homes that are going in there, and I think it's like four or five hundred homes there. And by 2050, that's a long time from now. Eight years is all we're going to be around here and be another board of supervisors. And it is potential for growth up there. And I do think since the uh, uh, sheriff's representative, Mr. Thibodeau, uh, had said that our call times now in the unincorporated areas are, are hitting the ceiling, uh, that they uh, don't want to go past, I think it's critical that we do not rule out the fact of a, uh, a substation here, too. So we keep that definitely on the list. But if you want to look at other options, that's that's fine. But I think uh, for today, for the motion today, this is to move forward and just hold the land is what the uh, action that's would right. be. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Along with just, just adding a recommendation to have staff as a part of the CNSS, other possible options. Okay. Would be a recommendation for. That's fine. Okay. Seconder? Yes, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Motion by Supervisor Desmond, seconded by Supervisor Anderson, including the addition of recommendation four to assess other potential uses of Parcina. Not seeing any additional comments, please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes with uh, Vice Chair Vargas voting no, all other supervisors being present and voting aye. We're gonna move to uh, item 32. Uh, item 32 is authorization to negotiate and execute an agreement with Interface Community Services for funding of recuperative care medical respite bed facility. Uh, I believe we have some uh, some comments on this from staff, and then we will see if we have any public speakers. Um, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, Ebony's here to answer any questions that you might have on that. You've already heard two speakers uh, on the last item that we're actually calling for this item, but I believe the first speaker that we stopped may want to be calling back in, and there may be uh, speakers here in the audience. But Ebony is here to answer any questions that you would have on this. All right, let's Thank go to our public speakers. Thank you. Well, uh, the caller that was uh, called in for item 32 just left the conference line, but uh, we'll hear from the speaker in person, Audra Morgan. We'll have two minutes to address the board. Audra Morgan. Um, so as we keep talking about funding, I thought I know where we can find a whole bunch of money in your bonds. And those can actually go to help the people because once you violate your oath, that's illegal, it's, a vi it's against the law. And people can go after these bonds for that. And so perhaps, you know, $100 million would be really good for the city because it could be used for what we need it to be used for. Because otherwise we're just spending buckets of money here and there for, uh, recuperative care and, you know, we're not going to stop people from needing that. We're just going to pay for it to be available to them if they need it. So how about going after your bonds to stop you from doing this? There's a whole lot of money in there that could go to the city and all the people that you're harming by violating your oath. I mean, I could just sit here for like 40 seconds. Yeah, you, can, you need to be speaking. So okay, I'll, I'll just, talk. Just keep, keep going. You keep can go going. Ahead. Okay, because I don't know if you know about, um, uh, I think it's Assembly Bill 630. It says in there that violating your oath is a crime. So, I mean, you guys realize that you're doing that, right? I mean, the people are coming to you repeatedly. And you work with some and not others. And, and why is that? Why is it some you'll work with and others you just dismiss and roll your eyes and don't even look at them half the time, tell them you won't even meet with them, you fundamentally disagree. But what, what does it take to, to get to your heart, to, to something that matters? If it's something that matters to us, you know, you talk about helping everybody, but you won't. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll now hear from the individuals that requested to speak by phone. 
You will hear a notification that your call has been unmuted. You will then need to press star six to unmute your line. We'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. And if you could please identify the callers. Our first caller is 3280. 3280, please press star six to unmute. Hi, I'm actually calling for item number 29. My name is Felipe Rios. I'm the Chief Program Officer for Interfaith Community Services. And I was originally calling to support Supervisor Lawson Reamer's desire to utilize the property for another use and to look rather than just a substation. There's a lack of affordable housing in North County, so um, i just like to go on record as supporting Supervisor uh, Lawson Reamer. Thank you. Our next speaker is 4526. 4526, please press star six to unmute. Hi, Supervisors. My name is Greg Angel. I'm the CEO of Interfaith Community Services. I apologize for not being able to be there in person with you all today. Um, I want to thank all of the supervisors for your support of an investment in expanding recuperative care for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Interfaith Community Services operates the only standalone recuperative care center for uh, homeless individuals in our county. Um, however, it is a small 32-bed location. Since it opened in 2015, we've successfully helped more than 1,000 veteran and civilians recover from uh, medical and mental health conditions that landed them in the hospital and also moved them successfully into stable housing. There is demand for more, and this investment will allow for the development of a former motel site in Escondido uh, to immediately provide an additional 54 recuperative care beds with opportunity to expand north of 100. Um, not only are we helping individuals, but we're saving the county a lot of um, taxpayer dollars by keeping uh, veterans and civilians out of county psychiatric hospitals. Um, we're caring for them in a trauma-informed, um, proven effective way. And operationally, these programs are funded by our healthcare partners. Um, so this investment from the county would be a one-time support to create needed capacity to help individuals who are exiting hospitals in the need of recuperative care to heal and to move forward in their lives. I am um, available for any questions on the project or any comments, and again, I appreciate uh, each of the supervisors support on this item. Thank you. That concludes public comment on this item. Also note that we received two e-comments, both in favor. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful project. Interface is a great partner. Happy to move approval of the items. Is there a second? All right, we have a motion by myself, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just uh, chime in because I could barely hear uh, Mr. Angel. Uh, but since Interfaith Communities opened up their current locations in 2015, their recuperative care program has served more than 1,100 homeless veterans and civilians uh, directly from hospital discharge. 93% of them uh, had their recuperative care needs met, and 75% transitioned into stable housing. Uh, interfaith programs, they work. Uh, they're fiscally responsible, they're operationally funded, and entirely by the healthcare partners and in need of expansion. So I'm pleased to support this investment and allow for these services uh, to be expanded uh, with, uh, with uh, Interfaith uh, Community. Thanks. Thank you. We have a motion by myself, second by Vice Chair Vargas. Not seeing any requests to speak. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. All right, we're going to move to our final agenda item today, uh, item 34, general services authorization to advertise and award a design build contract for a new county animal shelter in Santee. Uh, let me go first. I believe we have a staff presentation on this item, then we'll hear from any speakers and return to the board. Thank you, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. Uh, today we're requesting permission to proceed with the next step in development of the new county animal shelter in Santee. This project was first presented uh, in the SENA of 2016 and most recently was uh, fully funded in this year's operational plan. Since uh, its construction in 74, the Benita Animal Shelter has operated out of an 18,000 square foot county owned building. However, this facility is no longer adequately does no longer adequately serves the needs of the community, the animals, or the staff there. As the facility approaches its 50th year, the building elements are close to the end of their effective life cycle, 
making repairs and maintenance more expensive and time consuming. Additionally, the building technology and animal care support spaces are becoming visibly obsolete when compared to current industry standards. After considering many other locations, the Santee site was selected as it provides a better geographical, geographical area of coverage for the unincorporated areas of the east and south county, where most of the services are needed, as shown in this uh, service activity map. The Department of Animal Services provides animal-related law enforcement, sheltering, medical, emergency response, and pet adoption services to the unincorporated areas of San Diego County, including animal intake during disaster events. The facility be located on a four acre lot of the county owned Edgemore property on Riverview Parkway. This location provides easy access to the main thoroughfares in the area. The site's currently vacant and it overlooks the San Diego River area. Due to its proximity to the river, the project will strictly comply with the county stormwater quality management. Architecturally, the new uh, animal shelter will respectfully be integrated into the urban fabric of Santee. CEQA findings will require mitigation in three categories, biological, cultural, and uh, hazardous materials. The project's impact to biological resources will be mitigated uh, consistent with the county's biological significance determination guidelines, uh, specifically in uh, mitigation for coastal sage scrub and migratory birds. Uh, the project's potential impact to cultural resources will be mitigated by impl implementing a site grading monitoring program with both a county-approved archaeologist and a Native American Kumaye monitor uh, present during the ground disturbing activities. And the project's impact associated with potential hazardous materials uh, within the undocumented fill on the site will be mitigated by implementing a soil monitoring program. The proposed county animal shelter will comprise approximately 24,000 square feet of indoor spaces with an additional outdoor large animal barn and corrals. There will be uh, open and shaded areas between the buildings for both public and staff use, and the facility will allow the county's sustainability goals, will follow uh, sustainability goals by targeting a LEED Gold building with a zero net energy certification. The new building will be, a, a new building and associated kennels, barn, and site amenities will provide a more efficient facility to better serve its customers and a safer environment for the department staff, animals, and the public. Once the new facility is complete, the Bonita facility will be vacated and may be marketed for sale or leased by DGS with the proceeds used to reimburse the Edgemore debt service. A draft mitigated negative de declaration was circulated for public review for a period of 30 days from 15 December through 14 January of 21. Uh, five public comment letters were received and responded to. The final MND incorporating response to the received comment letters was completed on June 28th. Upon receiving board approval, uh, DPC will post a design build request for a statement for qualifications and begin the procurement process. Uh, after award, the project design and permitting process will last through third quarter of 22 uh, and followed by project construction through the first quarter of 24 when we will turn it over to animal services. In Closing, we offer the following recommendations. Find that there's no substantial evidence that the project will have any significant uh, impact on the environment, and adopt the MND, finding that it reflects the independent judgment and analysis of, the, of your board. Adopt the mitigating monitoring and reporting program outlined in the MND. Authorize the director of uh, purchasing contracting to advertise and award the design build contract for this project. And authorize the uh, director of DGS as the county officer responsible for administration of all contracts associated with its construction. And with that, uh, that concludes our presentation, subject to your questions. Thank you, Marco. Uh, let's go to our public speakers on this item. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have one request to speak in favor of this item. I'd like to invite forward Mayor John Minto. You'll have two minutes to address the board. Well, board, how do you sit there this long? So, um, <laughs> uh, Chair, nice to see you again after Wonderful all these years. Wonderful to see you, Mayor. Welcome. And uh, good to see you in person, I think, for the first time. And good to see the rest of you. Uh, let me tell you, Santee has never had a very good um, reputation of working with the county. And um, I, But I want to tell you that we're here today to say that those days are gone. 
And just like uh, the discussion earlier about working together as uh, board members, I think we're doing, going to do the same thing with you as uh, a collaborative member of the community. So I want to get some things out here before I forget because my city manager's back there saying, hurry up. So, by the way, uh, Supervisor uh, Nora Vargas, uh, nice to see you too for the first time uh, without being in front of a camera. So here we go. Uh, uh, we look forward to working with uh, county staff on this uh, project and um, the improvements, these um, uh, public improvements. Are, the only thing we're gonna really ask here is just a couple of things, is that there be some roadway improvements to the Riverview Parkway and Magnolia Avenue along the site's frontage and public river trail with a 45 foot wide easement set aside for that purpose. And the uh, city uh, request that uh, there be a consideration of these improvements first and foremost for that Riverview Parkway. Uh, the me mitigated negative declaration states that the river trail is a biological mitigated mitigation measure which will which the project does not trigger, yet the river trail is part of the regional San Diego river trail system. I know that you guys are very involved in that. We would ask that you consider uh, putting that in when you would put in the uh, animal shelter and it's only about 970 feet, and uh, we think it's a great idea. That area certainly hasn't had a lot going on there for years, and it's about time something happened there. We too uh, have been in negotiations or discussion for years about a public safety center there. We're happy to find someplace else for that and help you out with uh, getting your uh, animal shelter there, because this benefits everybody. So if you have any questions, I'm available. If, not, if you have any questions of my staff, they're available also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, go to uh, Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you, Thank you Chair Fletcher, uh, and very nice to meet you as well, Mayor. Um, so I understand that the existing facility that we have needs uh, a great deal of serious system upgrades and the site that has sufficient space for the services uh, and the animals that are taken care of for our shelter is what's driving this proposal. Um, however, in my district, residents are very concerned that they will have to travel farther, and some of them have horses and are concerned about moving these services. So considering the time it'll take for the development of this project, could I, could I just have um, the team uh, really talk about sort of their community uh, outreach and engagement for the communities that have to come to depend on the services provided by this site, and then also would like to request um, how staff is going to be working with our communities through this development and how we're going to be communicating uh, the resilience planning in the case of the need for emergency services. I, I think we had chatted about this, but I also want to discuss, um, you know, uh, as we are advancing our sustainability efforts, I want to make sure that we're not missing out opportunities to offer services or have sites provide services for some of our other um, folks in the area as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Vargas, for those, those comments. I, I wanted to highlight um, a changing operational model for the Department of Animal Services. Uh, with the new facility that will be centrally located, they're also planning on adding a mobile unit, and that will allow animal services staff to go into communities uh, where people are um, to provide critical vaccination and spay and neuter services um, for people who may be transportation challenged or live in rural parts of our community. They're able to get out um, rather than people coming to us, um, the concept of, of going to them. Um, as Marco mentioned, the Bonita facility was built in, in 1974. Um, he said it was nearing 50, which I resent because that was my birth year. Not quite 50 yet, um, but it is it is an aging facility, um, and this this new one uh, will have the capacity to accept large animals, which is very important during disasters. Um, Department of Animal Services has 30. Uh, locations throughout the county of San Diego so that if people need to evacuate their homes because of fire or another disaster and they um, you know don't have uh, the capacity to take their animals um, animal services in partnership with humane and other animal welfare organizations can care for those animals at these 30 different staging areas um, so we're very excited about 
the model change of really taking animal services uh, to constituents uh, where they are. And Kelly Campbell, who's our director of animal services, is here today, and I'm sure she has something additional to add, but I, I did want to offer those comments. I appreciate that. And I hope we can work with County Fire to make sure that our residents are really informed, because I think that's usually when folks are in the process of that panic mode so they know exactly where to go and beforehand. I, I would just add, if you go to readysandiego.org, there's a whole page on pet preparedness, and there's, there's actually a plan for household pets and also for livestock. Um, people can, can walk through what they need to do in advance of a disaster to be ready. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Holly. Um, Chair Fletcher and members of the board, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I'm Kelly Campbell, I'm the Director of Animal Services. Um, and as Holly mentioned, I'd like to highlight uh, a new operational model that Animal Services has begun pursuing. Um, and that's both in the interest of um, meeting constituent needs and meeting animal needs throughout the county. Um, animal Services is really people services. 67% uh, of American households have a pet. Many have more than one, um, and for most of us, that pet is a member of the family. So, you know, we're very sensitive to um, the fact that where there exist needs in human populations, there exist needs in the animal population as well. Um, so we're, we're very interested in making sure that we're able to improve our service levels for constituents, um, highlighting that uh, hub and what I think of as a mobile spoke model throughout the county. Um, as Holly mentioned, the mobile unit that we're planning to add will enable us to offer um, basic care, uh, including vaccinations, licensing, spay neuter, um, other small um, basic care items that are necessary for, for critical health and well-being, but can be very difficult to access if you don't necessarily have transportation or something is not in close proximity to you. Um, we would estimate that that unit could be deployed on a daily basis for every day that, that Animal Services is currently operational um, and that we would be able to see approximately 30 constituent clients each day. Um, so we would be happy to have a routine schedule in communities where that's necessary on a regular basis and bring those services to the people. Thank you. Is that a motion to approve, Vice Chair? Um, I'm happy to second that. We'll go to Supervisor Anderson, and then I have a couple comments. Supervisor Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, uh, I have some just some quick questions for you all. So <clears throat> why didn't we just upgrade Bonita? I mean, why are we making a big move and changing all since we have mobile services? Why couldn't the mobile services service my district and keep Bonita? That was our original tensor, um, but af after a change in the model to a serving only in the unincorporated areas, uh, we went through a, a, a siting uh, process um, by tr trying to figure out where the best optimal place was um, to proximate to all the unincorporated clients. And Kelly can chime in if, if she has other than that, but that's the general uh, thrust of the, uh, the effort. Certainly. So there, uh, so, uh, uh, just so I understand that part of it, so is there a, a greater need in uh, my area than South Bay, or I would think that there'd be universal animals everywhere. Uh, is it are we are we focusing this to work more with unincorporated area? So is it based on the unincorporated aspect, or what? What's the tipping point? Yes, it's based on the where the, the highest level of service is needed in the unincorporated area. So Ramona, Spring Valley, and Santee, Lakeside, and the, this the site was most central to those places. Uh, in, there wasn't anything in, say, Lakeside that, I mean, uh, um, we're having to go through some streets to get there, you know, uh, uh, you know, it seemed like Lakeside might offer a lot more locations. We did look at several sites in La uh, Lakeside. They were, not they were not county sites, and they are not immediately available to us uh, through the real estate process. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. So um, I, I had uh, spoken with staff, and, and I know the numbers, but I'm not sure who gave them to me. But how many visits during 2019 did we have per day for this facility? Uh, in cars. Uh, Kelly knows that best. 
Certainly. Um, the range of visits uh, in 2019 in cars um, was between, I would actually have to check the number specifically, but I believe it was 38.9 was the last number that we saw, Marco. Um, 38.9. Pre-COVID, pre um, yes. And then during COVID, what did we look at as far as visits? Vis About 15.2 visits per day. Okay. And um, uh, when it gets to land use, if somebody was going to build something in the unincorporated area, what would be the number of cars per day to trigger road upgrades I by think, county standards? Well, that would be highly dependent on the infrastructure that's set there. So it's always um, analyzed with whatever infrastructure is in place in that area. Um, I don't know if the mayor is still here. Uh, uh, would it be appropriate for me to ask the mayor, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming down, and what is the standard for Santee? We want to be good neighbors, and we want to make sure that... I'm going to get my... Uh, why, don't, why don't we have the city manager come talk? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I just want to say, when I'm in Santee, you never say, hey, uh, would you bring Helen along to answer my questions? You always force me to answer. Just saying that on record right now. Well, it, you know, it's kind of like uh, here. Um, none of us are really planners, and the people no, I'm just, we rely on... Mr. Staff. Mayor, I'm teasing you. <laughs> Go on up here. Uh, I have uh, Melanie Cush, and uh, she's actually our department head in uh, development services. Can you answer that question? Chair, Board of Supervisors, thank you. I've been listening to your agenda all day and it's very, very interesting. You're asking about our standards for road improvements. This particular site is located in the Riverview Office Park Master Plan. And when the plan was adopted in 2006 and the county was a partner to it, the anticipation was that road improvements would be triggered at time a development proposal was was received. And so right now, <clears throat> the county had, well, the county developed half of Riverview Parkway to serve the, the Las Colinas detention facility. And the idea is that when development occurs on the other side of the street, then the road would be made whole. So we, we all along expected that to happen. The mitigated neck deck identifies 516 average daily trips for this facility. Correct? Okay. So what they've, what they've assumed that, what, what they've assumed is that this is a local serving facility. Local serving, SAC T. But we've also heard that this is a hub and it will serve a much larger area. And, and, and as a consequence, we're also hearing that the average daily trips at Bonita are less than 40 a day. Did I hear you say 39 and then 15? So the question is, what is real? What will we actually see here? And my, my assertion is, it doesn't matter. The road is, it's time to step up and build the rest of the road. We're asking for Riverview in particular because the county animal shelter is relying on that road to get in and out. We would love to see Magnolia improved, but we realize that might be asking too much. We would like the trail improved because the trail does many things. It, it promotes non-motorized movement, right? It will reduce greenhouse gas, gases because of that and it promotes the active lifestyle that we all want, especially after COVID. So if we were to try and pin down what the standards are, our standards are in the master plan. And now is the time, if not now, when? The county owns the property. I'm emotional about it because I've been living <laughs> with the master plan for, for 16 years. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks. All right. We have a uh, motion uh, by Vice Chair Vargas, seconded by myself, uh, to approve the project as is. Uh, the recommendations are in there. I want to I want to thank Mayor Minto for coming down. It's always a good day when we can have actual, truth-based discussions about important public policy items before us. 
Uh, you know, I, I have a great interest in the river trail, and we're making very significant investments with a lot of partners throughout San Diego County. And perhaps the day will come where we do that with Santee, but today is not that day. So we will see how the future goes and uh, look towards our development as a region and advancement as a region, certainly look towards, uh, towards that continued collaboration in a, in a positive direction. Uh, with that, let's uh, take a vote on item 34, motion by Vice Chair Vargas, seconded by myself. See no other questions, please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We have a new addition to our statement of proceedings. It's new for this, uh, this board meeting. It's basically is a dedicated section for supervisors who wish to provide updates on board committee reports. Uh, these could either be board subcommittees, they could be boards where, uh, where individual supervisors sit. There's no requirement that anyone report anything, but as we have subcommittee meetings and people meeting with other groups, we wanted to uh, add it. So at each meeting moving forward, we'll just take a moment and I'll just ask all of my colleagues if you have anything that you would like to share uh, as it relates to board committee reports. If not, that is entirely fine. Uh, at this point, does anyone have any updates they would like to share? Hello. Supervisor Desmond. Sure. Um, myself and uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer met yesterday on the Moving the Songs of Spent Nuclear Fuel Committee. I think the first ever of its uh, kind of or meeting. Uh, it's been in place for quite a while. We met yesterday and we're going to be bringing forward a recommendation to the board for uh, potential approval uh, at our August meeting. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair Vargas. Um, I have a lot of committees, uh, <laughs> but one of them that I think I want to make sure I share with the community is that uh, Supervisor Anderson and myself met regarding the Transparency Committee. There was a lot of um, discussion that we have. We are looking at a date for August where we will be having uh, a workshop to invite the community to share the thoughts and ideas. Uh, I know the budget team is super excited about it, and uh, we have a lot of uh, work going on around that. And then I think the other one, uh, so that, that one committee. And then the other committee that has been very active is our uh, South Bay uh, Environmental Justice Task Force, and I want to thank the Luge team. Uh, we are really thrilled uh, that the folks from the EPA um, have agreed to join our committee now formally, and so we are going to do everything in our power to continue to battle uh, the contamination in the Tijuana River Valley. It's, it's one of my priorities, and it should be a priority for the county as a whole. So I am thrilled about the work that's happening there um, and advocating at the federal level and state level for additional resources. Um, that's off the top of my head, and next time I will have a long list. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect. No pressure. Uh, that concludes our business before the board will now proceed with adjournments and memories. We have four adjournments today. The first adjournment will be presented by Vice Chair Vargas in memory of Father Joe Carroll. Uh, thank you, Ch Chair Fletcher. I wanted to adjourn in memory of Father Joe Carroll today. Our community has suffered a great loss. He dedicated over 40 years to helping the homeless and raised tens of millions to provide housing, food, health care, and education, and other services through Father Joe's uh, villages. Father Joe first got involved with helping our region's homeless neighborhoods um, back in 1982, um, uninspired by his Nash, Nash nationwide research of providers. Uh, Father Joe decided to create a unique one-stop shop to provide services for the homeless. In the late 1980s, Joan Clark Center opened up offering housing for families and single adults and medical, medical clinic, child care meals, and job training, and they continued to do really innovative work, particularly around access to health care uh, for our homeless, unsheltered population. The San Diego Union Tribune uh, dubbed him the Hustler Priest as he was a local icon and a champion for our city, our region, and our less fortunate. We thank the contributions of Father Joe Carroll and extend our condolences to his team that I, sure, I, I am sure will continue to honor his legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next two adjournments will be presented by Supervisor Desmond in memory of Dr. Thomas uh, Brennick and Don Alum. Supervisor? Um, I don't know what names you got there, but I got Don Burgett and Dr. Lionel Burton. Is that what you said? Okay. Why don't we adjourn for those? Okay, we'll do, we'll do that. Okay, uh, I'm going to do two of them. Uh, Don Burgett, he was born in uh, Iowa, graduated from North High School in Des Moines, studied at the University of Iowa, and he served in the United States Marine Corps from 1953 to 1963, and he's retired as a sergeant. Uh, following his service, he traveled and became a truck driver in the 1980s. His real, he uh, obtained his real estate license and started a 22-year journey selling real estate. Don is most known in the community as a congressional community representative. He served the voters of the 75th Assembly District and the San Diego County Central Committee. He is survived by three children and one late son, 
seven grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren. Donald will be greatly missed by his family, friends, and community that he diligently served. Second adjournment is for Dr. Lionel Jean Burton, uh, known as Doc. He passed away on June 25th, 2021, just shy of his 94th birthday. Doc was devoted to public service and was a pillar of leadership in the San Marcos community. He first served as a mayor of San Marcos, serving two terms. He served as the president of the school board and as a board, of the mem a board member of the Vallecitos County Water District. Doc Burton was a graduate of Washington University in Missouri and a graduate of Kansas City College Osteopathy and Surgery. Doc and his wife, Marilyn, first settled in Dallas, then Oregon, then he began his medical career before establishing a practice in San Marcos in 1960 where they raised their family. There he provided obstetric, obstetric, I can't say that. He provided obstetric and pediatric care to families in San Marcos for decades. He's an avid sports enthusiast. He played, uh, he enjoyed serving as a medical doctor for the San Marcos High School and Palomar College athletic teams. He's survived by his wife, Marilyn, and his four children, uh, Jeffrey Burton, Scott Burton, and, uh, and Robin Torrey, and nine grandchildren, his brother, Curtis Burton, and his wife, Sue. Both will be greatly missed for their community and their families. Doc Burton served for the San Marcos uh, committees on the uh, Parks and Recreation Committee for decades. So thank you for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Desmond. And my apologies to Dr. Thomas Brennick and Don Lum. I hope uh, you are doing well. I don't know how they got on our journalist, but uh, I certainly uh, wish them all the best. Uh, our final adjournment today, I want to remember uh, Donna Marie Robinson. Donna was born in Chicago on November 12th. 1957 to uh, Raymond and Dottie Robinson. Donna earned both her MBA B and MBA from the University of Chicago and went on to a long and successful career in commercial banking in Illinois, Wisconsin, and New Jersey before relocating to San Diego in 2013. Everywhere Donna Marie went, she left quite an impact, and that is certainly true for San Diego's philanthropic community. Here are just a few of the many causes she devoted her time and talents to. Uh, LGBT causes, underserved communities, uh, mentoring and education, children in need, safety for women. For the last seven years, Donna Marie was also a member of the San Diego Foundation's Board of Governors and also served on the Foundation's Executive Committee, their Black Community Investment Fund, and the COVID Impact Loan Fund. In addition, she was a fierce and passionate advocate for women's health and health equity as the member of the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women Executive Leadership Team and Vice Chair of the Circle for Red Giving Society. In 2019, she was featured in the Faces of Go Red for Women, a campaign spotlighting the need for research on women's heart health. Uh, as dedicated as she was to this many issues, she cared deeply uh, for her family. She was always there uh, for her family and friends who meant the world to her. She survived by her parents and spouse of 32 years, Cynthia Kellogg of Encinitas, her sister Rhonda Grohl, her nephews Josh and Dor Jordan, she adored her grandniece, Gracelyn, her grandnephew, Weston. She's also survived by her sisters-in-law, Kathy, Amy, and Liz. Every interaction anyone ever had with Donna Marie, whether a phone call, a walk on a trail, sharing a glass of wine, left one feeling better and happier because of her positivity, her kindness, and her tremendous smile. We send our heartfelt condolences to all of Donna Marie's friends and family uh, who I know are feeling a tremendous sense of loss, and on behalf of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors, we adjourn today's meeting in memory of Donna Marie Robinson. With that, we will recess into closed session. We will take about a 15-minute break, uh, and uh, we will reconvene in closed session, and we will see you all tomorrow. The board will now recess into closed session to consider those matters listed under item 37 on today's agenda. If there are any reportable actions, they will be reported out during the planning and land use session of this meeting tomorrow, Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. I'll be close to